and hand sanitizers outside. And for our participants online, if you wish to participate, if you wish to make a comment or questions, please use the raise hand functions or put the questions in the Q&A box. And don't forget to include your name and affiliations as you make the questions. You can also live stream our event on uh, Nguyen Thu Bien Dong Facebook and the South China Sea Studies on YouTube. We also update the live tweets on the South China Sea Connect on Twitter, the South China Sea Connect on Instagram and on TikTok. Uh, yesterday, we received a lot of uh, questions and comments on those social media platforms, and we will try to incorporate, we will try to transfer those uh, comments and questions to the organizers. And for the official press release, please visit the South China Sea Conference 13th website uh, for the summary for the official uh, press release and media and more. Our official video and publications of the conference will be published very soon. And Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, welcome back to the second day of the 13th South China Sea Conference, looking back to your brighter futures. Yesterday, we looked back at the security and legal development in the South China Sea, the historical evidence, including the San Francisco Treaty uh, on its 70th anniversary. And today, we will focus on the future cooperation part in institutions arrangement, in science, economics, and so on. A special part today is the Young Leader Program at the end of the day, the Dojo Program at the end of the day, so don't forget to tune in to join 20 excellent candidates from uh, all over the world, Vietnam, China, India, Myanmar, Malaysia, the Philippines, the UK, and more to hear what our future stakeholders have to say about the state of play in the South China Sea. And don't forget the live commentary today with Associate Professor Huang Eng Tuan, former ASEAN Deputy Secretary, Secretary General and Ambassador Bui Thay Zhang, but first, we have the honor to invite uh, Dr. Nguyen Hung Sun, Vice President of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, to uh, conduct the keynote sessions. Please, Dr. Sir. Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends near and far. Welcome to uh, the second day of the South China Sea Conference, and we are delighted to welcome you with a very special keynote session in which we are absolutely honored to be joined by Excellency Ambassador Sujan Shinoi, former Ambassador of India to Japan, and now Director General of the Manoha Parika Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. The IDSA is one of the most prominent think tanks in India, and we are absolutely uh, pleased to be joined by the Director General, who is going to give his vision of the Indo-Pacific, and probably we would like to hear uh, his assessment of ASEAN's role in the Indo-Pacific as well. Yesterday, Sir Ambassador Shujan Chinoy, we had a very long day of discussion. We have heard views from various stakeholders of the Indo-Pacific, including that from Australia, from ASEAN, from our European friends, and also from other stakeholders in the region. We are uh, sort of like missing India's views in here, and uh, your presence today is going to complete our vision of a connected and cooperative in the Pacific. So without any further ado, I have the honor to invite Excellency Ambassador Sujan Chinoy to take the floor. We are all longing to hear your presentation. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can see me.
to speak on the theme, constructing a cooperative and connected Indo-Pacific. And uh, you will agree with me that a look at the region's recent history is unavoidable if we are to build a better future. One must necessarily begin with a justification of the use of the term Indo-Pacific, particularly since uh, China uh, and some others favor the continued use of the term Asia Pacific, which gives a special place naturally to the East Asia region with China as the traditional fulcrum of trade and investment flows. The shift from the term Asia Pacific to the Indo-Pacific is not without basis. After the Second World War, access to the great market of the United States of America across the Pacific led first to the economic resurrection of Japan, followed by similar success stories in East Asia. The Indo-Pacific, by contrast, is a more contemporary and inclusive term, which acknowledges that growth and prosperity are no longer limited to East Asia, perhaps no longer limited to China, and that growth and prosperity, trade and investment flows are now distributed over a much wider region beyond East Asia to South Asia and all the way to the East Coast of Africa. Historically, the Indo-Pacific existed long before the geostrategic competition of the 21st century between the United States, that is the reigning hegemon, and China, the rising hegemon, brought sharper focus onto it. In the past, colonial powers such as Portugal, Spain, Holland, France, and Great Britain were all motivated to acquire extraterritorial privileges and to consolidate their presence in both these oceans using strategies of mare librum, that is open seas, and mare clausum, which is closed seas, to protect their monopolies of trade in the age of exploration, in that age of colonialism. The Indian and the Pacific Oceans have always been conjoined. On the other hand, the term Asia Pacific is an artificial construct linking an ocean to a continent which did have its historical context and relevance. In the age of discovery, colonial powers engaged in geostrategic contestation to divide maritime space into exclusive spheres of influence. The Portuguese, for example, carved out the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean for themselves. The Spanish had their own hemisphere of influence straddling the Pacific Ocean. In their own zones, they acted as constabulary and did their utmost to monopolize trade and to provide laissez passe to other powers only in exchange for concessions elsewhere. Today, however, the world is changing rapidly. And in this rapidly changing world, there is friction once again between major powers centered around the maritime domain. The Quad nations advocate free and open maritime space and a rules-based order. China views the Quad with deep suspicion as a potential security alliance aimed at containment of her rise. As of now, the Quad clearly is not a military alliance. It focuses on capacity building, advanced technologies, critical supply chains, and healthcare, including the production of vaccines. It also aims to build a wider consensus on developmental issues through the Quad Plus mechanism. Separately, the Quad nations have an annual Malabar naval exercise, which is not, strictly speaking, part of the Quad. It's a standalone arrangement, and that too is not a naval alliance. It is instructive for the ASEAN to be mindful of attempts by vested interests to malign the Quad 
or to create fissures within ASEAN on issues such as the draft code of conduct. There will no doubt be motivated efforts to project the Australia, UK, US, that is the AUKUS trilateral security agreement as detrimental to ASEAN's interests. In reality, in my view, AUKUS will address the disruption in the balance of power, which has in recent years been occasioned by China's rise and its economic power, as well as militarization in the maritime domain. AUKUS will enhance the security of Australia and its trade routes, including across the Pacific. ASEAN's economic prosperity also depends on peace and stability in the Pacific, not just in the South China Sea, for it is the waters of the Pacific that carry trade across for many countries in the region to the largest market of the world, to the largest economy in the world, that is the United States of America. The trend over the past two decades has favored China on her periphery, where her reach and influence has risen at a time when the US had particularly shifted its focus onto the global war on terror. Today, China seeks to limit the presence and extent of the US and other major powers on its periphery. But there is a contradiction here. For like the US, other major powers like France and the United Kingdom are also resident regional players with major stakes in the future of the region. ASEAN lies in between the two great oceans. ASEAN has significant stakes in the South China Sea. In recent years, ASEAN nations are torn between their growing economic dependence on China and the consequent dilemma of multiple security choices. They are loath to face a Hobson's choice to have to choose between the United States and China. ASEAN centrality is a geographical fact. However, the legacy of territory, territorial disputes and a contemporary struggle to corner natural resources, connectivity, and sea lanes of communications prevents a consensus from taking root. There are myriad dialogue frameworks and regional structures that have achieved some success in promoting cooperation on a number of issues, anti-piracy operations, human, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief, that is HADR, climate change, fisheries, capacity building, and connectivity are among these that have made progress. The IOR, ARC, ASEAN, and APEC, in their own way, have sought to build consensus, but they have done so in a piecemeal manner. As yet, there is no overarching architecture in the Indo-Pacific for dispute resolution. The region's security architecture certainly has not kept pace with its economic architecture. In my view, the East Asia summit process offers a broad-based and inclusive dialogue mechanism to address the entire panoply, the entire spectrum of issues in the Indo-Pacific. Both China and Russia are part of the framework, and that is advantageous. India is one of the few countries that has consistently stood up for an inclusive architecture for the Indo-Pacific. Recently, at the COP26 summit, Prime Minister Modi launched the initiative for resilient island states, IRIS, that's the acronym, for developing infrastructure of small island nations. This is part of Prime Minister Modi's long-standing efforts to develop the blue economy in the Indian Ocean, particularly in the context of Sagar, that is security and growth for all in the region. This inclusive approach is aimed at bringing India closer to Indian Ocean littoral nations through the 
IORA and linking India to both Africa and the ASEAN countries. India's Indo-Pacific vision received fresh impetus with the launch of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, IPOI, by Prime Minister Modi at the East Asia Summit in Bangkok in 2019. The seven areas identified under the IPOI for regional cooperation have since gathered momentum. Maritime security, maritime ecology, maritime resources, capacity building and resource sharing, disaster risk reduction and management, science, technology, and academic cooperation, and trade connectivity and maritime transport have nothing to do with territorial disputes or major power rivalry. These areas under IPOI have the potential to unite the regional countries. Unfortunately, China and Russia, both part of the EAS process, have generally chosen to keep away from the IPOI. The South China Sea has traditionally united civilizations, not divided them. Today, the South China Sea is a hotly contested space. China's claims are challenged by several Southeast Asian nations in regard to the many reefs, islands, and artificial features. Their militarization is bound to raise tensions even further. UNCLOS is no doubt the sole international legal framework which provides for dispute resolution under the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the PCA. The PCA ruling on the South China Sea was rejected by China. Besides, its infirmity lies in the fact that its rulings are not enforceable. UNCLOS seeks to codify a law of the sea, which is a very complex task. Fresh filings for extended continental shelf are also proving contentious. At the same time, the PCA ruling of 2016 that went against China proved to be a turning point in many ways. It drew attention to the importance of respecting the rule of law and adherence by signatories of UNCLOS to its fundamental tenets. Finally, there is no gainsaying that the many trilateral and multilateral dialogue structures, as well as arrangements for maritime cooperation, have contributed to efforts to build a peaceful and secure South China Sea. But the work is still in progress. Countries such as Vietnam have every right to be concerned about their sovereignty territory, and natural resources, which are under threat today. From the Indian perspective, one hopes that the Indo-Pacific, particularly the South China Sea, will see reduced friction in the future. But the current reality, sadly, suggests otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency Ambassador Sujan Shinoy for a very comprehensive and um, insightful presentation of India's vision of the regional architecture and of the Indo-Pacific. Now, I would like to invite our audiences, excellencies, ambassadors, and distinguished scholars in this room, as well as online, to interact with Ambassador Shujan Chinon. You can raise your hand, uh, grab your microphone, or you can send in questions from the Q&A box in the Zoom chat. So um, the floor is now open. There is a question from an online participant, Captain Shijian Tian. Captain Tian, you uh, can turn on your uh, camera and then ask the question. Please go ahead. That's Captain Tian, are you there? Maybe I can go to the audience in this room first. Uh, Marcus, you have a question? Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Chennai, uh, my name is Marcus Winsley. I'm the Deputy Ambassador at the British Embassy here in Hanoi. Thank you very much for your very clear exposition. Uh, I served four years in Delhi. I always enjoy Indian strategic thinking. Uh, and you must have got up very early this morning. Um, my question is, uh, you set out very clearly the return of the seas, the return of navies. Um, of course, the Royal Navy in the UK is very pleased to hear this. Um, I wanted to ask uh, you about thought in Delhi about building other forms of connectivity between Southern Asia and Eastern Asia. Um, uh, it's uh, sort of notoriously famous for not having a great deal of, of land connectivity, for example. I wonder if, if that was also a topic that you were discussing quite frequently now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for raising that question. Indeed, it's rather early uh, in the morning here in Delhi, uh, but I would do anything uh, to participate in this uh, very prestigious uh, conference. Um, let me also say that I have often written and spoken about the return of the prodigal, uh, that is the United Kingdom, back to the region. Uh, and as I said earlier in my remarks, uh, none of these countries uh, not the United States, not the United Kingdom, not France. None of them are extra regional powers, and that's a fact of history. It's also a contemporary fact uh, for uh, just as uh, the United States has, uh, so do uh, the UK and France and many others uh, have uh, very uh, large trade and economic and investment stakes in the region. Some like France and the UK also have uh, territories uh, and other uh, nationals in the region. Uh, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, yes, I look at uh, this uh, also as an inclusive uh, structure uh, that the region uh, has many kinds of regional stakeholders and it does not exclude uh, those uh, such as the UK. Now the UK uh, has also come back recently is obviously part of that uh, uh, traditional presence that it maintains. Uh, as far as connectivity is concerned, I think uh, uh, I, sh I should mention here that India attaches a great deal of importance to its uh, uh, Act East policy, uh, a Look East policy that was turned into an Act East policy by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, and under this policy, uh, we hope to enhance our ties with uh, not just Southeast Asia, but beyond. Uh, we have tried to uh, do more uh, with regard to our uh, proposals for, for instance, a trilateral highway uh, that connects India through the Northeast of India uh, to Southeast Asia. Uh, we are doing more with regard to uh, expediting the Kaladan uh, multimodal uh, transport corridor, uh, which includes uh, certain waterways as well. Uh, and above all, we hope to be able to work with like-minded countries like Japan, uh, for Japan has uh, a natural interest in economic uh, prosperity and connectivity here through its uh, enhanced uh, partnership for quality infrastructure. Uh, and India's Act East policy uh, hopes to work with uh, Japan as well uh, to do more in the region, bilaterally, trilaterally, uh, we are doing uh, much more as well. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, there's often uh, an observation that uh, India is uh, the weakest link in the Quad. And yet we've seen an increasing interaction of India in the Quad and increasing participation of India in Quad activities. I wonder if you can comment on how India would like to see the Quad developing. And would um, quad participation sort of cause difficulties for India to maintain its non-aligned posture in its foreign policy? I do not think there is any contradiction at all within the quad. There is complete unanimity uh, that the quad uh, uh, at, at the present is, is uh, 
a group of uh, like-minded countries that are working together at various levels uh, to promote various things such as, uh, for instance, capacity building, uh, vaccine production and distribution. Uh, they are working to advance uh, the notions of uh, free trade, uh, freedom of uh, navigation, uh, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, and there is absolutely no uh, contradiction uh, or difference of opinion here. Uh, in fact, uh, you can see how rapidly the coordinations have uh, sort of raised the level of dialogue uh, from the DG level uh, to the level of vice ministers uh, to foreign ministers and all the way to the summit level, head of state, head of government in a matter of uh, four years. So uh, we are also very clear that the Quad is not a military alliance. And therefore, the question of strong links and weak links uh, does not arise. I mean, I see absolutely no uh, debate or dialogue or discourse there. Uh, if you have false expectations of the Quad, if you imagine from the outside, or if you fall prey uh, to propaganda from the outside, that the Quad is a wicked thing, and that the Quad is aimed uh, at uh, the containment of X or Y, it is only then uh, that uh, these notions of it being uh, a putative uh, you know, uh, military alliance uh, comes up. And it is in that context that people like to uh, you know, examine whether India is a strong link or a weak link uh, in terms of uh, uh, its outlook. We must remember uh, that the Quad is aiming at uh, developmental issues. Uh, there are several pro bono issues there. But I cannot uh, uh, you know, gaze into the distant future and guarantee to you what the Quad will be like in five or 10 years time from now. What the Quad will look like in the future will depend on what the region is like, what the new challenges and opportunities are like, what the new threats are like. Uh, so its agenda is not frozen. Its agenda will evolve. But currently, I can assure you uh, that all four Quad countries are strong links in the chain, completely on the same page. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That's very clear. We have an online participation uh, who raised a hand. Captain Shi Chen Tian, are you now ready? Yes. Uh, Please thanks. go ahead. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, Ambassador, you defended the AUKUS uh, by saying that it is for the purpose of protecting maritime international trade. So my question is to protect what kind of international threat? What kind of threat is worth being protected by using the uh, advanced nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines? That's my first question. Second, John, uh, you mentioned about the rule of law in terms of the end clause. We know that the, India has the national maritime legislation on the EZ. So what do you comment on the US freedom navigation in India's EZ? Thank you. Uh, I will uh, speak in English because uh, there may be inadequate translation if I suddenly spring a surprise and switch to Mandarin. These are all very interesting questions. Uh, now, as far as AUKUS is concerned, uh, and I naturally purport to speak on my own behalf, I believe that AUKUS is a very natural uh, defense partnership between uh, three countries that have long been defense partners. So uh, the AUKUS uh, poses uh, absolutely no surprise to me, uh, for I can see from uh, the study that uh, we make that, uh, for instance, the United States and the UK have long been defense partners since their defense uh, pact of 1958. Even earlier, the UK nuclear program, as early as 1942, was actually part of the US's Manhattan program. Uh, Australia is an alliance partner of the United States of America. AUKUS is basically a defense pact devoted to the sharing of sensitive 
defense technologies, in this case, submarine technologies. Now, we have to keep in mind that looking at it from the Australian perspective, and I've served down under, I count among my old friends, uh, His Excellency, Mr. Kevin Rudd, for he and I also served together in Beijing in the early 80s uh, as fellow diplomats. Uh, let me tell you that uh, the Australians also uh, look to history. They have seen in uh, the Second World War that uh, Japanese uh, mother submarines uh, were able to come all the way up to uh, the outskirts of Sydney Harbor and launch uh, midget submarines. They have seen more recently that when they conduct the talisman uh, saber uh, exercises in 2017 and 2019, the Australians have also seen that Chinese uh, 0815 uh, Tong Tiao uh, auxiliary vessel has been tagging these exercises. Uh, the same uh, 815 auxiliary vessel that tags the uh, RIMPAC exercise in 2018. So this is now something that causes a great deal of concern, as I see it, in Australia. Australia operates uh, six uh, fairly outdated uh, Collins class uh, submarines, and uh, they are looking to enhance their reach uh, through uh, nuclear powered submarines, which have, as you well know, Captain, uh, much greater reach, much greater speed, uh, much greater operational turnaround in the waters around Australia. Uh, so this is something that they have to keep in mind. And I think it is with that in mind that they have gone in for this program. Uh, now, there is no uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, mention here of carrying nuclear weapons. We are talking about nuclear powered submarines. And this comes at a time when they see the Chinese uh, you know, nuclear powered submarine program, including SSN uh, uh, attack uh, submarines uh, and conventional diesel electric submarines, including uh, you know, uh, air independent propulsion, uh, conventional submarines uh, growing in numbers. Uh, so from the Australian perspective, it is certainly worrisome. It is worrisome for others like the US as well, whose own trade and prosperity depends on uh, the waters of uh, the region, including beyond the first island chain, being stable in their view. Uh, as far as UNCLOS is concerned, uh, India obviously fully supports UNCLOS, uh, for uh, UNCLOS is the uh, you know, legal mechanism for dispute uh, settlement. Uh, it's, uh, as I said before, not been able to address uh, all these issues. There are countries that have signed uh, and ratified UNCLOS and may not be fully observing the tenets of UNCLOS. There are countries that have signed but not ratified UNCLOS uh, and yet uh, speak of UNCLOS being uh, the guiding mechanism. Uh, here, you know, I'm referring to China and the United States respectively. As far as US FONOPS is concerned, or FONOPS by that, uh, 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 you know, by, uh, for that matter by anyone else, I believe that FONOPS uh, conducted by the US uh, in the South China Sea uh, or elsewhere are uh, part of the US uh, tradition of exceptionalism. We have seen that over the years. The United States in 2017, just as a point of reference, uh, conducted FONOPS, uh, uh, 2019, beg your pardon, conducted FONOPS against 17 countries, in which you will find listed countries like India, uh, Indonesia, and the Philippines, uh, all of which are uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, kind of uh, countries that have good relations uh, with the United States. So US FONOPS is uh, historically and traditionally part of their, uh, you know, uh, what we call exceptionalism that goes with their interpretation of uh, freedom of navigation. And uh, also, uh, as you are aware, Captain, being a naval expert, that they also have something called, uh, you know, right of innocent passage for their uh, naval vessels, including through uh, exclusive economic zones. Uh, and there also they refer uh, often to uh, UNCLOS. So it's a complex matter. Uh, in my view, FONOPS uh, does a lot to challenge any unilateral claims 
or uh, for instance, straight baselines that uh, you know some in China might be trying to claim in the South China Sea, etc. Uh, but FONOPS uh, fundamentally has also an infirmity, which is that FONOPS uh, do not reverse uh, what you call FET accompli. Uh, so FONOPS does nothing to reverse what is already uh, a fact of life in the South China Sea. But it does challenge the notion of uh, uh, extended uh, uh, straight baselines or extended uh, claims over territory, uh, or, or for instance, claims that uh, this is territorial sea. Those are challenged by FONOPS. And I don't see how this will uh, stop anytime soon. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Time is running out. But there is one last question that I'd like to ask you from an online audience. He's from the Center for International Studies here in Vietnam. And the question is, in terms of sea power, in modern day, long range weapons have changed the way Navy fought. The risk of losing a ship due to land based missile launch needs to be considered. So I want to ask if the Navy may be active in peacetime, but have less effect in any future war. Thank you. I wonder if you can comment on that. Yes, I think that's a relevant point uh, for there are many people who believe that uh, the days of uh, uh, absolute uh, sea power domination by very large vessels, uh, uh, that age is uh, coming to an end with the advent of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, area uh, denial, uh, anti-access uh, kind of uh, uh, strategic uh, structures in place, uh, particularly uh, given uh, China's focus on missile development and deployment, not just uh, across the Taiwan Strait, but also longer range missiles like the uh, Tongfeng 21 and the others that are known as the, uh, you know, uh, carrier killer, uh, so to speak, missiles. Yes, there is a renewed uh, debate about uh, the utility of uh, sea power in the absolute sense. In many ways, one can say that the United States has a presence, uh, a naval and a military presence in this region, uh, which is of two types. One, through the strategic alliance partnerships that it has, uh, which uh, you know, brings you to their presence in Japan or in, Viet uh, in, in South Korea, for instance, uh, and then they have a, a place in Guam, but they also have, uh, you know, at any given point of time, three of their 11 very large, sophisticated uh, aircraft carrier battle uh, groups in the region uh, available for deployment, uh, depending on uh, what is at sea and what is uh, undergoing, uh, you know, repairs and service. Uh, and uh, we have also seen uh, alongside the development of uh, missiles, uh, a lot of capabilities uh, for uh, developing anti-missile uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, development, uh, close-in weapons, uh, protection weapons for carriers have also undergone transformation. So the battle is shifting now to ISR in terms of, uh, uh, you know, satellites uh, and things like that, the communications. Uh, and the asymmetric part of it is under focus. Uh, but uh, I don't see how uh, land-based missiles and their reach uh, is going to completely halt the relevance of uh, sea-based power, particularly that exercised by uh, sophisticated carrier battle task forces. We have to keep that in mind. The, the day uh, an age of uh, dreadnoughts, as we had seen in the early part of the 20th century, uh, may have come to an end. But today's sophisticated vessels uh, have an array of uh, other uh, means to protect themselves also, to maneuver, uh, to defend themselves before missiles reach them, uh, to counter missiles with other means. Well, thank you very much, uh, Excellency Ambassador Shujan Chinoy. We are running out of time, although questions barely just start coming in. But, um, well, uh, I thank you for the wonderful opportunities to listen to India's perspective on the Indo-Pacific. Thank you for the opportunities for our audience to uh, interact with you. Um, we look forward to having more opportunities to interact with you in the near future. And we wish India uh, all the success uh, for its Act East policy. 
because uh, we see India as a very important uh, player in the multipolar Indo-Pacific and a very uh, key contributor to the uh, rules-based uh, regional architecture in the Indo-Pacific. So thank you very much, Ambassador Shujan Chinoy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Shinoy. So as heard from Ambassador Shinoy's speech, uh, we can clearly see that we cannot talk about the South China Sea without mentioning the role of uh, regional institutions, and which is exactly the topic of the next session, session five on the role of ASEAN and the Quad in regional architectures. And for these sessions, we have the honor to invite His Excellency Ambassador Phan Quang Vinh former Deputy Ministers of the Ministries of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam as our moderator for this session. So please, will you take the floor? Can you see me? Thank you very much. Hello? Can you see me? No, we cannot see you yet. Oh, let me see it. What, what is it then? Uh, maybe you would like to, yeah, there's a video, you need to turn on your cam. Can you see me now? Yes, wonderful. Oh, so thank you very much. And uh, I'm very much happy to join you today uh, in section five. Certainly we have come to day two of the conference and section five starts today on the regional architecture including the role of ASEAN and emerging other emerging uh, regional groupings, especially the Quad that has been the topic for this section. Uh, today, uh, discussions, we will have the benefit of a lot of discussions of the previous sessions, including on the overall picture of uh, the Indo-Pacific region and the South China Sea. So uh, I would like to, very much welcome all the speakers to this section five, including uh, Ambassador Igor Dreisman, the EU ambassador to uh, ASEAN, uh, Dr. Riza Suka from Indonesia, and Professor Kang Taiwe from Australia. We also have uh, Professor Hash Pan from India, but I was informed that Ambassador uh, Professor Hash Pan uh, will not be participating in today's section because of unexpected uh, reasons. So we will have three uh, key speakers for this section. Uh, as the schedule, we will have each of the speakers to speak for eight to 10 minutes. You have been advised of that. And uh, uh, originally schedule, our session will be from 8.30 to 9.30, but I think we, we have to add 30 minutes more uh, for the delay as we hear the keynote speaker just now. So uh, I'm very much happy to join you as a moderator and I very much look forward to the discussions of how the regional architecture can uh, be helping us in obtaining uh, the better future for Indo-Pacific, including the better future the prior future uh, on the issue of the South China Sea. So with that in mind, I would like to uh, give the floor to the first speaker of today, Ambassador Igor Dreisman. Uh, Ambassador Igor Dreisman is the head of the EU delegation to ASEAN. He has been serving in this position since 2019. He has been long serving in the EU and have a lot of experiences and responsibilities regarding the region, the Asia Pacific. And uh, I was told that his topics for today will be the EU as a reliable uh, partner of ASEAN. So Ambassador Igor Dressman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Pam Kwang Bin former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Vietnam. 
distinguished uh, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, allow me to express my appreciation to the organizers of this third South China Sea conference. And thank you for inviting me to participate in, the, in today's panel. Let me also take the opportunity to extend a warm welcome to my fellow uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rizal and Professor uh, Tyre, both uh, widely respected authorities on Southeast Asia and the wider Indo-Pacific. Uh, in a way, I feel rather fortunate to, to be the first one to speak, uh, because following them uh, will be no easy task. Uh, the title of our session, ASEAN and the Quad in the uh, Regional uh, Architecture, um, may lead some to question the EU's position within this particular framework, or indeed our inclusion in this uh, very session. After all, neither the EU nor any of our member states uh, participate uh, in any of the so-called minilaterals, be it the Quad or more recent uh, AUKUS. Uh, we are, however, proud to be a strategic partner of ASEAN and uh, in more general terms, hold a direct and significant stake in the region's long-term stability, which is an absolute prerequisite to an enabler of its prosperity. Southeast Asia's regional architecture, its strength, its vitality, its resilience is therefore of key interest to us as we want to see a stable, we want to see a prosperous region with ASEAN at its, at its center, guided by the values enshrined in the ASEAN Charter and with sufficient geostrategic space to have a say in the affairs of its own reach. Now, let me quickly outline the breadth and depth of our engagement with uh, ASEAN. Ours is a natural partnership, that of the two most successful uh, cases of regional uh, integration in the world. Not my words, but the words of uh, a uh, foreign minister of an ASEAN member state. Uh, connected by our shared values and a dense network of as many as 20 structured dialogues on a vast uh, array of issues of mutual uh, interest. This engagement is backed up by some uh, 250 million euro of regional funding, more than any other dialogue partner of ASEAN. Ours is a partnership based on joint prosperity. Uh, up to 2018, the EU was the largest source of foreign direct investment uh, for the region. Currently, we occupy the second spot. ASEAN is the EU's third largest trading partner after China and the US, and the EU is ASEAN's third largest trading partner too. Additionally, as much as 40% of the EU's external trade passes through Southeast Asia and, and uh, through the South China Sea in particular further underlying our interest in the region's stability. Ours is, as of last December, also a strategic partnership and one that continues to be comprehensive, even without needing the lab to be labeled as such. As we are nearing a significant uh, milestone, uh, we celebrate 45 years of dialogue relations next year. We look forward to our commemorative summit uh, and what we hope to be ambitious and tangible outcomes. Uh, to sum up, the EU is a stalwart partner of ASEAN and as such wants to see the region to remain peaceful and uh, prosperous. As we all of us are acutely aware, our relations with ASEAN do not, however, exist in a vacuum. Geostrategic developments happening in and around your region are bringing about their own complex challenges. As the center of the world's uh, gravity continues to move closer and closer to you, growing political competition, intensifying territorial and maritime disputes, unprecedented increases in military uh, spending have put peaceful coexistence in the region under strain. These phenomena, phenomena have in turn also fueled trade disputes that have reminded us about the fragility of our supply chains and the global economy as such. Now, this is a worrying mix, especially as the EU, along with the rest of the world, has no small stake in ensuring that your region stays both stable and uh, prosperous. Any other outcome would have far-reaching ramification for uh, all of us. ASEAN lies at the heart of the Indo-Pacific region and as such plays an important role in the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, which we launched some two months ago. 
the, pub the publication of the strategy is more than a mere reaction to the ongoing developments in and around the region. It's an affirmation of our interest in and a collection of very concrete proposals on how to ensure that ASEAN is not only central to the Indo-Pacific in purely geographic terms, but also geostrategically. To put it differently, we want to ensure that ASEAN maintains ample room to maneuver and has sufficient options amidst the ongoing great uh, power uh, rivalry. We do believe that we are uniquely positioned to achieve this and more importantly are uh, welcome to do so. Uh, allow me to quote uh, the uh, State of uh, Southeast Asia 2021 uh, survey by the ISEAS Institute. Uh, I exchanged about it yesterday with Dr. Rizal. When asked about the most preferred and trusted strategic partner of ASEAN and hedging against the uncertainties of the US-China strategic rivalry, as many as 40.8% of the eminent respondent listed the EU, making us the preferred uh, third partner of the region. Now, to accomplish this, the strategy outlines opportunities for closer cooperation on sustainable and inclusive prosperity, green transition, climate change, ocean government, governance, digital partnership, connectivity, security and defense, and human security. It also gives an explicit recognition of ASEAN centrality and mentions ASEAN as many as 31 times. I, I counted, I counted them. Uh, so our outreach will continue to be guided by our values, first and foremost, the belief in the rules-based international order and multilateral solutions that lead to inclusive and effective cooperation. On this, I believe that we're on the same page with ASEAN and we should explore how to engage closer. Uh, for example, both sides should uh, explore synergies on the uh, Indo-Pacific, not only as a political statement, but also concretely see what kind of overlaps exist between our strategy and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. In our engagement with ASEAN, we aim to remain a principal partner, partner and a credible alternative. In trade, we believe in a level playing field that leads to mutually beneficial outcomes. In development, we champion sustainability that leads to better lives for all. In engagement, we believe in inclusivity, just like ASEAN, as our offer to cooperate is open to all and directed against none. So it is my hope that these synergies and alignment in values will further strengthen our strategic partnership, but also ASEAN's central position within the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, lastly, uh, uh, Excellencies, let me underline that the EU is already active in working with and within the regional uh, architecture on both traditional and non-traditional security uh, threats. When it comes to the ASEAN Regional Forum, we have been amongst the most active participants on traditional security threats alongside Australia and today's kind hosts, Vietnam, we co-chaired the 12th ARF Intercessional on Maritime Security in April and held the third workshop on enhancing regional maritime law enforcement cooperation. On non-traditional uh, security threats within the realm of cybersecurity, Singapore and the EU held the ARF workshop on protection of ICT-related uh, uh, critical infrastructure. On counterterrorism and transnational crime, we co-chaired the 17th ARF ISM alongside Malaysia and New Zealand and co-sponsored the ARF statement on treatment of children recruited by or associated with terrorist uh, groups. Um, and I could go on uh, giving examples uh, like that. At the same time, we are aiming for closer engagement with the ADMM Plus and notably with the ADMM Plus expert working groups by being observer during the next cycle. In addition, we will continue to bilaterally engage ASEAN on security issues, including by implementing our joint statement on cyber security from 2019, and by continuing our EU-ASEAN high-level dialogue on maritime security cooperation. Uh, and we hope to have a next session in the very near future. Um, uh, to conclude, Ambassador, let me reiterate that as far as the EU is concerned, there is no viable alternative to preserving ASEAN centrality, which has served the region so well 
over the past decade and has significantly contributed to your region's stability and prosperity. We will continue to work with ASEAN and within its frameworks to ensure that the region's architecture remains strong. And our Indo-Pacific strategy should basically serve to amplify this message even further and enable us to deepen our long-standing strategic and substantial relations uh, with ASEAN. That's what I wanted to share with you uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Igor Treisman, for your insightful analysis and, and, and uh, comments on the topic, especially on the partnership between the EU and ASEAN. And uh, we hear that you stress very strongly that uh, the EU is a strong partner and resilient partner of ASEAN. At the same time, strong supporter of ASEAN centrality. And you mentioned that no viable alternative to the central role of ASEAN in this region. And especially you are supporting together with ASEAN for an open, inclusive Indo-Pacific and rule-based order, multilateralism. And suddenly you mentioned about the very much important uh, document or strategy of EU uh, issue recently, the EU Indo-Pacific strategy. I thank you very much, Ambassador, for uh, your uh, address. The next speaker I would like to invite is Dr. Riza Suka. Dr. Riza Suka is senior fellow at the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta. Uh, he was ambassador of Indonesia to the UK and at the same time to the International Maritime Organization from 1996 to 2000. He has done many uh, researches uh, extensively on, on issues related to Southeast Asia and ASEAN. So I have the honor now to invite Dr. Riza Shuka. You have the floor, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good morning to uh, everyone. Uh, uh, first, of course, and I would like to thank the DAV, you know, the, uh, and also especially the Vice President Nguyen Hung Song, who is a very close friend of mine. And it's really great to reconnect, you know, with the uh, friends at the Diplomatic Academy of, of Vietnam. And I also, you know, feel very, very happy, you know, to see Professor Carl Thayer, you know, on the screen. We have not met for a long time, I think, I think seven years. Uh, so it's, it's great, you know, to be on the same panel with uh, Professor uh, Carl Thayer, you know, especially on this, I think, uh, interesting and also important uh, topic. Uh, one small correction about my CV. I serve as a U ambassador to the UK in 2016, not 19. Oh, 2016. Yeah, 2016 okay. to 2020. And, and now I'm back to the uh, think tank circle, to the second track circle again. So uh, I can now, you know, actually uh, 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 enjoy my freedom to speak again. Uh, it's really, you know, constraining to be an ambassador. You, know, you, you can't actually speak what you think and you have to think before you speak. So that is, I think for an academic like me and also pro probably uh, to other academics, you know, it's quite, you know, uh, uh, constraining and a bit, a bit difficult. Uh, but again, you know, it, I, I find it also difficult to adjust back, you know, to the uh, uh, free environment of the academic community. But nevertheless, I will try, you know, to be as frank as I possible, you know, in, in, in addressing this particular uh, topic. Uh, as Sino-US rivalry, you know, becomes more intense, ASEAN faced multiple challenges. And I think we have been discussing what are the challenges that ASEAN are facing uh, since yesterday morning. And, and in this session, you know, we would like to look at, you know, uh, a very specific issue about, you know, uh, regional architecture and ASEAN's role in it, and then how, you know, ASEAN uh, should really see uh, the uh, role of, of Quad. And, and, and this is, I think, uh, that there have been a lot of debate, you know, on this issue, and especially on what are the possible consequences for ASEAN of this emergence of uh, a mini lateral, you know, uh, platforms in, in the regions. Uh, uh, and, and there are a number of uh, arguments being put forward. And first, as an extra regional powers began to formulate their own responses to great power politics, ASEAN is under increasing pressure to prove its relevance in the emerging regional order. And second, as ASEAN member state increasingly feels the pressure to take side, unity and strategic autonomy will not be under, uh, will be undermined. And the third body of debate you know, actually focus on as power politics has clearly exposed the limits of ASEAN's over-reliance on normative approach 
to manage great, great power competition, then the future of ASEAN centrality is at stake. So these are the three, I think, uh, issues that we have been debating, you know, uh, both inside and outside uh, ASEAN. In my view, the Quad and also uh, uh, AUKUS emerge within this context. Both these minilateral you know, happen because first, ASEAN has not been able to address and manage the challenge of rising China. And second, ASEAN has not been successful in giving guarantee or assurance that its member state will not take side in the growing rivalry between uh, China and the US. And then third, there is no security framework in the Indo-Pacific that can serve as a ballast and moderate the consequences of you know, great power politics. So therefore, it is not the Quad and AUKUS per se that serve as the key factors that undermine ASEAN centrality. You know, extra regional powers you know, become more active and assertive because of the perception that there is a problem with the ASEAN-centered regional architecture. So in this context, in my view, it is important for ASEAN to look at the Quad as a logical consequence of US-China rivalry and as a diplomatic response to the perceived China challenge. For the US, it is about preventing the emergence of a regional hegemon, while other members of the Quad have their own strategic reason as well. And I think Ambassador Chin I already you know, outlined uh, some of these, this issue. So therefore, the strengthening of the alliance and also the uh, security partnership you know, between the US and it, uh, other uh, countries uh, clearly serve the security interests of the participating states. So ASEAN, in my view, would be able to withstand the challenges of maintaining centrality and preserving strategic autonomy if the grouping sees the Quad as complementing instead of competing with the ASEAN-centered regional processes. And ASEAN can work with the Quad you know, because all members of the Quad are good partners to ASEAN. So this, however, must be done in a manner consistent with the ASEAN on outlook on Indo-Pacific, which emphasized the importance of inclusivity as an important element of emerging regional order. So the question then is, what are the steps that ASEAN can take to maintain its relevance and in turn, preserve its centrality? First, ASEAN should realize that extra regional powers tend to think that ASEAN member state have no agency as if that ASEAN member state cannot think for themselves. You know, for example, many suggest that, you know, uh, this mixed reaction to the AUKUS mean that there is a need for better explanation from participating countries to the ASEAN member state. But I do think that, you know, ASEAN already has its own views on whatever developments in, in the regions. So this is, you know, I think it's clearly uh, 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 suggest the fact that we are at the center of this you know, China-US rivalry. Uh, we often, on the one hand, told to be careful with China as, because China is dangerous. China does the same too. We are told that the West, as evidence in the formation of AUKUS, will undermine ASEAN, trigger arm race, and threaten Soviet Asia nuclear weapons free zone, and, and so on. So in that context, we need to tell both the US and China that ASEAN countries are not stupid and therefore they should stop being patronizing you know, to, to ASEAN. Second, ASEAN needs to acknowledge its own weaknesses. ASEAN has become too normative oriented regional institution and is not equipped to deal with the evolving geopolitical challenges in Indo-Pacific, such as how to preserve ASEAN unity in the face of the divisive nature of great power mm -hmm. politics. Two agendas I think is quite pressing in this regard. Number one, the revision of ASEAN Charter, and number two, the institutionalization of the East Asia Summit. So there have been a lot of ideas on how this uh, uh, institution can be uh, institutionalized further and can be strengthened. And, and in my view, for example, ASEAN can propose an ASEAN Indo-Pacific Charter where the institutionalization of the East Asia Summit can be included and, you know, uh, also form the core of that charter. So third, the adoption of a distinct ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific uh, is an important step by ASEAN responding to the geopolitical challenges in the region. But it is still not yet clear 
how this outlook can become an instrument to maintain ASEAN's relevance and more importantly, help ASEAN fulfill its strategic you know, interest. The objective that you know, ASEAN wants to achieve are quite you know, I think ambitious. For example, how to turn the regions you know, from uh, rivalry into a region of dialogue uh, to uphold rules-based regional architecture and, and so on. That require a more concrete you know, and strategic plan from ASEAN instead of merely the, uh, uh, the, the outlook. And I think former minister uh, Marty talked about this at length uh, I, I yesterday. So finally, you know, I do think that ASEAN can work with the court on some issues of common interest. And Ambassador Chinoy already outlined a number of areas that which I think you know, would be very useful for uh, ASEAN to work on uh, the, its you know, dialogue partners you know, who are members of the, the court. Disaster management, combating the uh, transnational crimes, addressing the pandemics, and all this you know, I think uh, is quite important for uh, uh, ASEAN. So, so in that context, again, you know, I would like to uh, emphasize that whatever you know, ASEAN wants to do, and then whether ASEAN can preserve the centrality, it really depends on how strong the willingness of ASEAN to change and reform, and then uh, how that ASEAN can actually convince other players, both you know, within ASEAN and also outside the region, that you know, it is time to focus more on the East Asia Summit you know, and try to create it you know, as a premier platform where you know, all uh, has a seat around the table. So I think these are the element, uh, you know, introductory comments that I can uh, 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 say, and then we can have more discussion later. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rizasuka, for your uh, excellent uh, analysis of the overall situation surrounding the region of Indo-Pacific and the challenges to ASEAN uh, in the context of emerging uh, uh, regional architecture with a lot of mini lateral groupings. And certainly, you have a lot of useful proposals as well. One of the key thing is that ASEAN is now facing challenges that you mentioned, uh, certainly external power engagement, certainly the major powers rivalry that uh, have ASEAN to rethink of its role, not only just normative, but it's now more towards action oriented uh, ways of doing things. So a lot of proposals, including on how ASEAN behave and interact between the two rivalries, especially between the US and China, and ASEAN can strengthen itself, including the, the charter, the East Asia Summit Institution, and also the AOIP on Indo-Pacific, turning it into uh, a kind of charter, a bigger document, and also a plan of action. The, that way, I thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, I will have now uh, the next speaker, which is very outstanding expert on, on the Indo-Pacific and also on South China Sea and on Vietnam as well. Professor Kam Thayer, he's the em, em, Emeritus Professor at the University of New South Wales, Australia, also director of the Thayer Consultancy and he produced a lot of uh, talking points and uh, documents and analysis of the region. Uh, we would love to have Ambassador, uh, we would like, uh, love to have Professor Kam Taylor to be with us today. So my honor to give you, um, uh, Professor Kam Taylor, uh, you have the floor. You have the floor, uh, Professor Kathaya. Connected. Thank you, Ambassador Bing. Uh, and I'd like to follow the previous speaker in thanking the Diplomatic Academy for inviting me. This is my 12th appearance of the 13 conferences that have been held. I had PowerPoint slides, but I'm not going to put them up in the interest of time and to compress. 
but uh, what I did is produ produce uh, a quad focus presentation looking at. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I do. I do. Can I be heard? Yes, to me, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes, thank you. Very clear. I can hear noise at that end. We can hear you. Okay. I got interrupted. Uh, should I begin again? I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Okay, I was uh, uh, thanking uh, Ambassador Ving and the D Diplomatic Academy for inviting me. I mentioned that I had prepared the uh, PowerPoint slides, but there doesn't seem to be a share quality, but in the interest of time, I will just speak to them. I'm presenting a quad perspective and my paper and, and the PowerPoints looked in detail at the agenda of the eight meetings of you can or cannot? For me, I, I do hear you. How about other participants? I can hear him. Oh, that's good. That's good. It's from yes, this there's... conference room here. We can hear you very well. Can Professor. you hear me? OK, thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. It's great. Me? We very all clear. can hear you. Just proceed the way you have. I'm hearing that the audience can hear me, but I keep getting here a voice telling me we can't hear you. <laughs> we can hear you, Professor. Just give on, give on. Maybe okay, well, I'll, I'll continue. I, my paper was, okay. Okay, thank you, Jim. Okay, right. My paper looked in detail at the agenda of the eight meetings of senior officials that were held from 2017 onwards. The three minute, uh, the three meetings of foreign ministers, and the two meetings of, of of quad leaders. And I won't go through the agendas, but it's interesting. In the beginning, if you look at if you look at this uh, progression, it is not until the second meeting of foreign ministers that a lot of the disagreements and, and, uh, and wording becomes clarified. Uh, at the beginning, it's maritime rather than maritime cooperation or maritime security. Uh, and there are a whole series of uh, instances like that. But the bottom, the bottom point that I would make is at the end of this process, with their agreement, the Quad has become institutionalized. And it has a structure of summits, foreign ministers, senior officials, and experts itself. The following points I make is that the Quad has moved into non-traditional security issues in a major, major way. The two summits in March and September of this year made that commitment even deeper. So before the Quad, and, and, uh, the, sorry, before COVID-19 came out, there were the senior officials were discussing an array of issues and the free and open Indo-Pacific then became one that should be prosperous. It should be inclusive as various members of the Quad made their positions known. Now that the leaders have met, there is standard language and a standard focus. In areas like maritime cooperation and freedom of navigation, which were mentioned in passing uh, in the uh, senior officials meeting, uh, particularly freedom of navigation, are no longer mentioned. Maritime security is, but no working group has been set up. So at the end of the first leaders uh, summit, they picked a, a wide agenda of dealing with COVID, climate change, counterterrorism, 
humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, quality infrastructure, critical te and emerging technologies, and cyber and space issues. But with the major, uh, and, and that uh, resulted in working groups on a quad partnership, a quad climate working group, and quad critical and emerging technology working group itself. Then at the second quad meeting, uh, real emphasis on combating COVID-19 now that India had agreed to allow the export of vaccines. It was going to be the center following the first summit of producing these, that Australia was gonna take the lead in delivering them. And now that India is producing and allowing export, a major, major push to get uh, free and safe vaccines distributed throughout Indo-Pacific, including Southeast Asia. Focus in practice on high quality infrastructure climate change, emerging technology, so repeating, and then a new initiative, training the next generation, offering scholarships uh, to each of the members of the quad for STEM, science, technology, engineering, uh, and, math and mathematics itself. So at the end, I, I reached the conclusion that the quad has institutionalized itself as part of the region security architecture with the summit, annual meetings of foreign ministers and the, and the senior officials, which have been meeting at least twice a year and an experts group. Therefore the quad, and I'm overlapping uh, with uh, Rizal and uh, the ambassador that spoke prior, that the quad is addressing key issues on ASEAN's agenda. There's considerable overlap, COVID vaccine and economic recovery, climate change, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, I'm repeating infrastructure, cyber, countering, countering disinformation, which is a, a new one, counterterrorism and critical and emerging technologies. So now when we look at ASEAN and the Quad, the Quad is considered at least in Australian circles as a diplomatic network. This is not a new Asian NATO by any stretch of the imagination of four countries. It's a forum for strategic exchange and positive practical cooperation which I mentioned in broad terms. It complements the engagements of its four individual members who are dialogue partners with ASEAN, a point made previously, and, and their participation in the ASEAN-led architecture. And, but the engagement uh, by the Quad with ASEAN and ASEAN-led institutions gives it a greater Southeast Asia than a whole of Indo-Pacific region uh, focus. Uh, along the way in Somme, they mentioned the East Asia Summit, the Indian Ocean Rim Association, et cetera, and those references seem to have dropped out, but at least the East Asia Summit was mentioned. So the Quad is institutionalized, but it's a work in progress. Its focus is on non-traditional security challenges. Officially, the Quad at its meetings has made no substantial progress on maritime securities in a military form. It complements other bilateral, regional, and multilateral cooperation by its members. But at the moment, among the Quad members, bilateral and trilateral arrangements are more uh, functioning better uh, than uh, the full uh, quadrilateral itself. So I, I end by with a picture of ASEAN at the center and centrality. And we have all these mini laterals bolstering regional security. The mutual security treaty between Australia and the United States, ANZUS, the five power defense arrangements, Singapore, Malaysia with Australia as a member, the trilateral security dialogue, US, Japan, Australia, the quad and the new boy on the block, AUKUS. What I'm suggesting, if we go back to an Asian financial crisis and how China didn't devalue and an ASEAN plus three was created to deal with economic issues between ASEAN, China, Japan, and South Korea. That one mechanism should be an ASEAN plus four where it deals with the quad. In, in part because people have been talking about associate membership in the quad or expanding it, and that would put pressure on an individual ASEAN country, Vietnam in particular, 
to choose sides or if it joined the Quad, that might anger China. But if ASEAN as a whole dealt with the Quad, then members could work on this array, very deep array of, of, of non-traditional security issues that overlap. And in, in fact, the, the Quad in terms of COVID vaccine and recovery uh, will continue to play a major role. So that's my major proposal is to institutionalize cooperation uh, between ASEAN and the Quad specifically on its current agenda which is highly congruent with ASEAN's. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Khan Thayer, for your extensive discussion on the Quad, how it inter uh, relations with, with ASEAN. And one of the things, uh, very interesting and useful uh, analysis of operation is that the Quad has turned itself from the focus of just only the strategic uh, focus of what to a more non-traditional security issues agenda, which is overlapping with other groupings in the region, including ASEAN. And the Quad is, as you mentioned, is not a military alliance or NATO in the East. So that's very uh, clear in mind. And one of the interesting proposal is that the agenda of ASEAN and the Quad are overlapping and they can work together. ASEAN still at the center of the region uh, where emerging regional groupings are coming. So ASEAN and the Quad can do something as institutionalize their partnership or linkages. That's what uh, we hear from you. Certainly everything is still evolving. Uh, we have exhausted uh, our list of speakers for today. Uh, three eminent uh, speakers from Ambassador Igor Dreisuchman to Ambassador Riza Shuka and Professor uh, Kanthaya. We have a clearer picture of the emerging and evolving regional architecture, why ASEAN can still in, uh, in the place of play uh, a central role in the region and at the same time, ASEAN must uh, reinvent itself in a way that it can interact more effectively for the region and also uh, with regard to other groupings that are emerging. May I invite you to the section of Q&A, the discussions. We have uh, several uh, questions from online and the floor. I have now here two questions for Ambassador Igor Dreisman, and one question as of now to Re Ambassador Riza Suka. So I will read the two questions first that are addressed to Ambassador Igor Dreisman, and uh, would like to invite you to respond to that. First, to Ambassador Igor Dreisman from teaching. Thank you for your insightful speech. My name is Teaching, senior student from University of Social Sciences and Humanities. My question, with the EU's experience of resolving my time dispute in history, how EU can support ASEAN to address and tackle the South China Sea dispute? That's for the first question from Teaching. The second one, From Lady Ang, oh, this is to Ambassador Schumann. The second one from Lady Ang, a research fellow of the CSIS, uh, Vietnam, I think. My question, that is Lady Ang's question. In the future, if ASEAN economic reaches its limit and can expand further, what region will be the next targets of the EU. I'm not quite sure of this one. In the future, if ASEAN economic, economy or economic reaches its limit and cannot expand further, what region will be the next target for the EU? So two questions uh, from the floor to Ambassador Igor Dreisman. Ambassador Igor Dreisman, can you respond to that? 
Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe starting with the second uh, question first on uh, economy. Um, I, I, I would argue that we're very far from ASEAN having uh, reached its full potential when it comes to economic uh, integration. Uh, we've we've basically seen an economic integration with with two phases. On the one hand, uh, we've seen that 19 almost 99 percent of the uh, tariffs amongst ASEAN countries uh, have been uh, removed. Uh, that's the positive story. The less positive story is that the number of non-tariff measures has increased. Uh, uh, dramatically, actually, if you look at the latest figures, they've gone times five over the last uh, 10 years. So there is a lot of potential still for more uh, integration within uh, ASEAN, uh, and hence there is a lot of potential also for uh, the EU to further increase its uh, investment, all the more so. Uh, if you look at the figures of the growing middle class within ASEAN and so on and so forth. So I think we are very, very far from having reached uh, the full potential for both uh, uh, ASEAN uh, economic integration and hence for uh, external investment by uh, players like uh, the EU. On the second question of the South China Sea, um, I, I just for the record to restate our position, uh, one, we do not take sides amongst the different maritime uh, disputes, but two, uh, we do stand for respect uh, uh, by all of the uh, international law and especially UNCLOS uh, 1982. And um, uh, the uh, uh, award which has been uh, concluded uh, uh, between the uh, uh, between uh, the Philippines and China has to be uh, respected. Uh, that's the second point. Uh, the third point: we've regularly expressed our concern about some of the aggressive <laughs> unilateral behavior in the South China Sea. It's not conducive to a peaceful uh, environment or any uh, resolving of the issues. Uh, uh, last point: uh, we have been calling for more transparency in the negotiations on the code of conduct between uh, China and ASEAN. We as EU, uh, I, I mentioned the trade figures not so long ago, we have an important stake ourselves uh, on, in this issue. So there should be more transparency uh, in these uh, uh, negotiations. So uh, <clears throat> having said all this, the, the question was about EU experience in, revolving, in resolving maritime disputes. Indeed, we have amongst EU member states had a, uh, a number of uh, overlapping claims or between the EU and third uh, uh, parties. So I think we'd be more than happy to share that experience uh, at any point in time that ASEAN would uh, want so. Uh, the first opportunity would be the uh, third high-level dialogue on maritime security, which uh, we hope to organize uh, uh, soon. Ambassador. Thank you very much for your uh, responses. I have received a lot of questions, but I think I would pick up one question that cover many of the, the ideas and, and, and suggestions uh, in other questions. And that question addressed to all the three speakers here. I will pick up a leading thing from the Diploma Cat Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Uh, Lê Đình Trinh asked, put a question to all the party, party uh, panelists. The question is, how could ASEAN and mini lecture arrangements such as Quad, RMC, of course, work better with one another, particularly when they have a common interest in peace, security, and development? The question is on how specifically that uh, some of the and 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 what are the uh, viable steps and options. Uh, there's a question also. Uh, if you command uh, ambassador uh, professor uh, uh, on AUKUS and how how you will see AUKUS in this context as well. So the question is how ASEAN could work together with other 
uh, mini lateral arrangements such as quad or course LMC and others, and what are the uh, viable and initial steps to be taken. Thank you very much. That, that question addressed to all of us, uh, the speakers. Can I respond first? Uh, please, Ambassador Kosuka. Yeah, Professor Teo, you know, uh, uh, wrote on the, on the chat that he can't hear us. Can, can you hear us now, Carl? Mm. I think there's just a delay on the line. He hears us 10 seconds later. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the question from uh, leading things, I think, is an important one, you know, and, and, and I think it uh, going again, going back to uh, my earlier uh, suggestions that ASEAN needs to institutionalize the East Asia Summit, you know, because the role or function of coordination, you know, of all these separate, you know, uh, 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 set up that works with, with ASEAN, you know, I think, you know, can easily be uh, discussed, you know, within the uh, what I call the multilateral leaders driven strategic platform uh, where multi layers engagement and cooperation in Indo Pacific take, take place. So, you know, for example, you know, all the discussion with the AD, within the ADMM you know, can, of course, be reported back to the East Asia Summit or discussion or progress you know, in the uh, ASEAN say, Quad cooperation you know, can also be. Yes, I can. Discussed, you know, and so on uh, 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 with the. Uh, within the East uh, Asia uh, Summit. So in that context, you know, I think this is important for ASEAN to really streamline you know, all these you know, uh, ASEAN-centered cooperation with two principles. Number one, ASEAN should no longer think that it, is, it must be the only game in town. It's the only party in town. You know, because it, now it requires uh, ASEAN to also work with other you know, cooperative realities such as Quad and 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 all, all other mini lateral uh, uh, setups such as the uh, uh, LMC and, and and so on, and there have been also of course you know the five power defense arrangement before. So this is the first I think uh, reality that ASEAN really need to uh, take into account and then try to find ways how you know it can actually coordinate the cooperation uh, with those kind of institution. Number two, the cooperation between ASEAN and all the others minilateral should be based on the principle of inclusivity. So it should not, you know, really uh, even, you know, give any impression that it is meant against, you know, any uh, party within the East Asia uh, Summit uh, framework. So that's my response to uh, Lee Dintin. Uh, I will shortly respond to the question on AUKUS. Well, again, you know, being a realist, you know, in international relations, I do think that the AUKUS is a logical, you know, a progression of the U.S.-China rivalry. So it's actually, you know, uh, it's, it's been predicted, you know, it's been uh, uh, anticipated before. Uh, so, you know, in that context, you know, it really serves, you know, either the interests of participating states and also because of their own consideration about what are the challenges that they face, you know, in the uh, security uh, uh, arena? So, you know, in that context, I think there is no point for ASEAN, you know, to try to find a common uh, position on how to respond to AUKUS. I'm, I'm against that, you know, because, you know, even within ASEAN, it's actually we do have differences, you know, in opinion. Even within, you know, one country in ASEAN member state, our views differ with regard to, you know, uh, how sh uh, we should respond to, 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 to AUKUS. So that's, I think, uh, my two brief, you know, respond to the two uh, questions that have been put forward, you know, uh, uh, to all of us, number one, and also especially to me on, on the AUKUS. Thank you very much. Any other speakers, Ambassador Igor Dreisman or Professor Kataya, if you would add something to that, or we come to the next questions? Maybe just very uh, briefly, okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, very briefly indeed. Um, I, I do agree that the best answer is to strengthen further the ASEAN-led uh, regional uh, architecture. That is uh, the absolute key. It has to be uh, uh, e built even stronger, more efficient, more focused, and so on and so forth. That's the first uh, uh, point. Uh, the second point on the East Asia Summit, 
of course, you will know that the European Union is not a member of the East Asia Summit. Uh, so I, I think at some point uh, there should also be a discussion, I think, on this particular issue and the discrepancy there is between the opinion polls you see of the EU being the preferred third partner in the region, including uh, uh, more and more on security and the fact that we are not member of the uh, uh, EAS. Uh, but that is that is a side uh, remark for uh, for reflection. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Suddenly, we know that uh, the EU has been expressing its interest for some, quite some time. Thank you very much. I recognize that from the from the floor, from inside the room, we have a question from Ambassador Wang Anton, who is the uh, Vice President of the Diplomat Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. So can, can you uh, put up your question uh, from the floor, please? Thank you, Ambassador Vinh. I have a question for all the three speakers. Uh, on in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we cannot you know, uh, rule out the role of China and Russia. So we have mentioned you know, uh, various initiatives, arrangements you know, like uh, IPOI, like uh, OCUT, Quad, ASEAN. And how about the synchronization you know, of these initiatives, arrangements you know, with those of China, like FCO, BRI, among the others? Uh, that is also a way you know, to engage China you know, in the uh, wider Indo-Pacific uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Huang So. That question addressed to all the three speakers. So I would love uh, one of you to, to respond to that and add it by others. Thank you, Professor Kantayo, Ambassador Rizak Sukman, or Ambassador Yudon Trisman. Well, so, so far we we, we expect you, that you know any engagement or any uh, 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 issues that you know dialogue partners is actually has, uh, including you know the uh, progress with regard to its you know cooperation with other entities outside uh, ASEAN. You know actually is uh, you know uh, they inform ASEAN through the ASEAN Plus One you know mechanism, and also you know through the other you know ASEAN Plus mechanism. ASEAN plus three, you know, where China can actually uh, inform, you know, ASEAN about how the SEO is going and also within the ASEAN plus uh, China uh, uh, meeting, you know, the summit, they can also, of course, you know, uh, uh, inform us and then, then we can coordinate with China on that particular uh, subject. So that's why I find the uh, proposal by Professor Taylor on the ASEAN plus four, you know, as the formal way of cooperating with the court, I think, is... You well, know, if I could jump in one. first on the nuclear issue, because one thing coming out of this, uh, the high-level meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping was to try to... So where is it? So continue, please. No, no, I think there is a gap. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a gap, but that's I, right. Yeah, yeah. That's good. No, that's good. It's a gap by ten minutes, I it's, guess. It's, it's not only it's ten delay minutes. transmission. It's a gap. Delay by minutes. ten minutes. But anyhow, it's, yeah, it's so, more no, interactive. No, 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 I'm done. <laughs> you know, because you know, all the questions will you know bring us back to the question of the you know uh, strengthening of the ASEAN uh, institutions and and also capacity. So that's I think is critical because. Well, let me give you one small example. You know, we keep telling ourselves that, you know, we should contribute to ASEAN Secretariat, you know, at price, at cost that we are comfortable with. So it's quite minimum. How can we expect in ASEAN Secretariat to coordinate all the ASEAN activities with 21 million per year? You know, <laughs> even, you know, five years ago, it's only 11 million a year. So that is one thing that why, you know, I think, the discussions uh, since Vietnam Championship of ASEAN on looking at you know, the, uh, the charter again, try to review it, 
and then try to come up with proposals on how we can strengthen ASEAN is a very important one. And then we hope Cambodia can, you know, I think, push that, you know, a particular agenda again. And then Indonesia in 2023 can also focus on the institutionalization of ASEAN and also strengthening the capacity. So we already start that process. So we should not, I think, uh, stop, you know, in trying to renew and also reform, you know, ourselves. Otherwise, all this prediction that ASEAN will become, you know, uh, uh, irrelevant might be true. We have to prove all of them is wrong. You know, as we all, you know, heard, you know, it's, it's really great to hear Ambassador, you know, this month, you know, he's, you know, EU ambassador, but so optimistic about ASEAN, while we are not that optimistic in the region. So, you know, we, we need to learn something from that, you know, uh, optimism. Thank you very much, Ambassador Riza Suka. I will give the floor to Professor Kang Sayer, but adding another question also, which is very much related to the topic uh, raised by Ambassador Huang Engtuan. The question from Udai Banu Singh to Professor Kanthaya. It's interesting that uh, Professor Kanthaya has proposed uh, ASAN plus four uh, with the Quad on non-traditional security issues. So the question is, how would you like to suggest and in what way for ASEAN would or should respond to AUKUS? So you can have uh, responses to both this question from uh, Udai Singh and Ambassador Huang Engtuan. The floor is to you, uh, Professor Kang Thayer. Uh, it's delay a, a little bit. Australia is too far. <laughs> Australia is very far away. <laughs> Under the sea. So we need of course to carry the 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 the, the cables <laughs> transmission cables. <laughs> Professor Kathaya. Already. Uh, while we are waiting for Professor Kathaya, may, may I suggest to you that we have many questions arriving, but I will pick uh, one from the young leaders, which is also to, uh, to Dr. Riza Suka. My name is Kao Viet Hung. My name is Kao Viet Hung, where is it? My name is Kao Viet Hung, a participant from Young Leaders Program. And the question is. Thank you, Ambassador Bing. Also, oh, you, you had. I only on wanted to address uh, to uh, Hong Wen Dun's uh, question the nuclear component and saying the meeting, the virtual meeting between. I hear you. The I meeting you. between I President Biden and Xi Jinping had an under. Had an under. It's good, it's good. Yeah, I'm getting all these voices in my ear. From... But, yes, I'm but, trying to but... respond, but I'm getting feedback of lots of voices coming from discussion that make it make me stop talking in case. <laughs> so please proceed for getting all the noises. We can hear you very clearly, uh, Professor. So is it okay? Right, uh, let me take the second question first about how to respond to AUKUS and answer it 
Australia has answered that question. Our foreign minister just went to Malaysia, Singapore. She just went to Malaysia, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, Indonesia. But it happened at the same time. You had the, the, the AUKUS, the Quad, and the ASEAN Australia Summit. And what that meant was that three factors came together. AUKUS, AUKUS is about military technology, defense industry integration between three countries, two of whom. Yeah, I, OK. The AUKUS is really about two countries, the United Kingdom and Australia, which have an alliance relations with the United States, cooperating militarily, has very little to do with ASEAN's agenda. The Quad does. And I said, from an Australian perspective, Maurice Payne went to the visit to ally concerns about arms race and nuclear proliferation. And that was clear in the statements issued in Indonesia and Malaysia. But what is on the agenda is the comprehensive strategic partnership with Australia that needs to be filled in. So and that's the first country to be granted that status. And perhaps China will get it at the meeting shortly. So my, my reply to, to Singh is forget AUKUS as an organization to deal with. It's the big boys on the military side doing what they do. And already uh, the chair issued a statement uh, after the Australia summit mentioning that there was discussion about AUKUS within ASEAN and obviously no consensus has been reached. And then to repeat my first point, to, to get back to Ambassador Tun's uh, comment, was that uh, China and the United States, when Biden and Xi spoke, want to initiate discussions on the nuclear issue. And that's important because it touches on Southeast Asia's concern. And so ASEAN should be supportive of that and push its Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty. The problem there is that China wanted to join it at the very beginning. And ASEAN wisely, in my opinion, took the position that get, to get all the nuclear states to come on board at the same time. But that's only taking one issue. Now, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, we heard today uh, a stress from Rizal about uh, raising up the level of the East Asia Summit. I agree. I read the penultimate draft of the ASEAN outlook, and it was Vietnam that tried very hard uh, to insert East Asia summit, and all those clauses were watered down. So it's been perhaps time to revisit it uh, because it's a leaders led forum. It puts ASEAN at the center, and it gets not only the Quad, but China and Russia and other countries together. So that's probably the way to go uh, and make it the premier summit, and, and hopefully post COVID the leaders can then meet, and then you can have all these side sidelong talks. So emphasize the quad, don't get involved with AUKUS, just let it go to the side, uh, but focus on the nuclear issue, which is of concern, mm -hmm. and make sure that when China and the US are talking, they take into account the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which they've acceded to. That's how ASEAN can assert its centrality. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your comment and especially for your suggestions on both the Quad and of course different way that ASEAN will be deal dealing with that. We still have a lot of questions, but I think time for us is li uh, is limited. So I will pick up the last one from the young leaders who are watching, helping us in this conference. And the question from the young leaders uh, will be addressing to Ambassador Riza Sukma. Uh, you have mentioned that ASEAN has been uh, too much normative for quite some time. It's now for ASEAN to be more practical institution. So how do you think that ASEAN members will be reacting and doing this? And how will be the risks of major powers influencing members of ASEAN when ASEAN as an institution become more practical. So the 
the two elements of the question addressed to Ambassador Riza Sukma. You have the, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, here, you know, on the Q and A, it also says that Dr. Alan Chen, you know, is going to answer this question live mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, I will let on also rely on uh, his uh, uh, answers. But you know, I, I I will be very very brief. That you know what I mean by you know two normative uh, ASEAN so far you know in facing this serious I think geopolitical and geoeconomic challenges uh, challenges of the day. You know we use the word hope so much. We hope we don't have to choose. Expect and hope. Yes, we <laughs> hope that you know there would be no war. We hope that China and the U.S. You know, will uh, basically uh, come to terms and also coordinate their, you know, a uh, 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 relationship and, and so on. But now it is the time for ASEAN to translate that hope into a strategy, and we already have the basis for their strategy, which is the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So now, you know, we need to operationalize that, you know, uh, documents or, or outlook. Uh, but it is not enough by just inserting in, I know, I think the Indonesia is doing this, inserting in all those uh, uh, area of cooperation, maritime, you know, cooperation, economic cooperation, connectivity, infrastructure, and so on. So like Marty said yesterday, you have a great documents. Half of it is so beautiful. It's very good. But the other half has no connection with the first half. So so I think we need to revisit all those and then, and then try to really uh, look at what are the real uh, things that you know ASEAN need to, 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 to focus. So we cannot rely on norm shaping and norm sharing all the time. You know, so we need to move from this norm shaping you know, into a more, I think, uh, concrete. Of course, that will require the strengthening of institution. So that's why in the last summit, uh, Indonesia proposed that ASEAN to look at the, uh, uh, the uh, strengthening the capacity and institutional you know uh, efficient effectiveness you know as one area of cooperation that uh, one area of review that you know ASEAN need to look at so hopefully this can start you know under Cambodia uh, chairmanships you know uh, uh, soon so that's you know we managed to identify the challenges the problem that we face but we have not really uh, 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 work on things that we need to change in order to respond to those uh, uh, challenges Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Riza Sukma. I think uh, time is limited, so we kept uh, captured most of the things for this section, section five. Uh, during the discussions, uh, there have been insightful presentations by, by the three uh, outstanding speakers, uh, Ambassador Igor Dreisman, Ambassador Riza Sukma and Professor Kanthaya. And also it's very lively and interesting uh, responses in the Q&A section. I still have a lot of more questions, but because of the time limit, so I must uh, say sorry to those uh, who put the questions that have not been answered. If we can meet uh, in person, so the coffee break will be very much lively as well to the three speakers because the topic is so much uh, related to our daily lives here in the region, especially in the context of emerging uh, challenges to ASEAN, to each individual country in the region. And they bring both as through the analysis by the speakers and uh, in, in the Q&A section, it brings both opportunities and challenges. But one very key question is that uh, even in the context of emerging mini lateral groupings, uh, we still have the recognition, the common recognition of ASEAN's central role to play here and all support the role of ASEAN, all support the rule-based order and an open and inclusive uh, order in this region. There are a lot of insightful and helpful uh, purposes on how ASEAN should and must react to the challenges uh, uh, that we face today. So my honor to work with you and I will not be saying now, thank you to the three speakers, Ambassador Igor Dreisman, 
Ambassador Riza Sukma and Professor Kang Thayer. Very much hoping, hoping now that we can meet in person again. Thank you very much for joining us and, and share with us your insight. Thank you. The session is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the Academy, uh, Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Thank you once again, our moderators and our speakers. And thank you, our online audience as well, for posing a lot of questions. We've been receiving a lot of questions on Facebook and on YouTube. And I'm sure, just as I do, we all learn something from the presentation. And right now, uh, we will take a short coffee break. We will resume in the meeting rooms at 10.45 uh, for session six. And just a little bit of the reminders for our online delegate. Uh, you can rewatch the footage and the videos and also the uh, presentations of uh, other speakers later on our official website, uh, South China Sea Conference 13.dav.edu.vn, or uh, you can stay connected with us on our uh, South China Sea Connect Twitter or on Google and on Facebook for further official information. The press release has been updated there. And for last minute registrations, uh, we have reopened the last minute uh, registration link for our. And don't forget to catch the live commentary with associates, Professor Dr. Huang Anton later about uh, Quad and the ASEAN at 1.20 p.m. See you. Thank you. Twitter, YouTube, hoặc là trên Zoom. Uh, Học viện Ngoại giao sẽ tổ chức phần bình luận trực tiếp thứ ba về phiên bốn, phiên năm về ASEAN và Quad, về phát biểu của Đại sứ EU và Đại sứ Ấn Độ với Phó giáo sư Hoàng Anh Tuấn vào lúc 1:20. Mời quý vị khán giả chú ý theo dõi. Quý vị khán giả cũng có thể xem lại những video và những tài liệu liên quan đến hội thảo tại trang web chính thức của hội thảo uh, SCSC. 13.dav.edu.vn hoặc tiếp tục theo dõi với chúng tôi qua Facebook nghiên cứu Biển Đông và Twitter South China Sea Connect. Xin cảm ơn.
to strengthen them and that questions shall be addressed in session six of the south china sea conference moderated by his excellency ambassador jr ratnam from the embassy of singapore in vietnam so please ambassador the floor is yours A very good morning to everybody and a warm welcome to our session on disrupted supply chains, how to ensure a resilient sea lanes amid COVID-19. Uh, first, let me thank DAV for organizing this uh, really excellent event. And uh, I think we all have learned so much about it. This is my first time here. So I'm uh, very, very honored uh, that they have invited me to moderate this session, which is something I think is, takes us a, a little different track from what we have been looking at on the geopolitics of the region. But now we are looking more at the geoeconomics of the region. I think all of you all are very familiar that COVID-19 has disrupted, the disruptions caused by COVID-19 has exposed the complexity and weakness of global supply chains, I was just reading up a global supply, global vessel schedule reliability has fallen from an average of 75% over the past few years to 35 to 40% in 2021. Ships on average are arriving seven and a half days later than they used to. Besides COVID-19, 
there are other important stress points that have been testing and straining global, global supply chains. This pandemic has prompted a rethink of extremely lean production <laughs> networks, and it has hastened and shifted away. Uh, sorry, it, it has hastened the shift away from just in time to just in case. There's also been a renewed focus on finding the right balance between resilience and self-sufficiency. These issues are as much driven by political considerations as economic imperatives. To discuss all of this this morning, we have four excellent speakers which will bring their expert perspectives in addressing these pressing issues. I think you all have their CVs in your booklets, so I will not go through their CVs, but their, but their credentials are obvious. And, but first, before I give the floor to our first speaker, let, let me introduce them in the order in which I will call to make their presentation. First, we, we will hear from Ms. Davani Zavari, a research analyst, Drip and Capital, who will take us through the global shipping crisis and the detrimental impact it has had on the rising tide of freight costs on small and medium-sized business. Then we will have Dr. Nguyen Kwok Chung, Head Service Sector Development Strategy Department, Institute of Development Strategy, Vietnam Ministry of Planning. This will be followed by a video presentation uh, from Dr. Michelle Akiro, uh, Associate Professor of Maritime Logistics and Dir Director of the Hepat Lloyd Center for Shipping and Global Logistics, who will look at the maritime nexus of increasing resilience of global supply chains. Then Dr. Alejandro Reyes, Director of Knowledge Dissemination Asia Global Institute will address supply chain stress and resilience, the pandemic and geopolitics. And finally, our discussant, Ms. Shihoko Goto, Acting Director, Asia Program at the Wilson Center will have the daunting task of distilling the key points from the speakers and frame the issues concerning supply chains. Each speaker has been allocated 10 minutes. I would urge them to keep to this time limit so there's a sufficient time for half an hour question and answer. Now let's get started. Ms. Davani Zavari, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. And a very good morning to everyone seated at the panel in Vietnam and all the people on this virtual Zoom call. Paper we have seen at Drip Capital looked at the shipping crisis, which has emerged all the way from December 2019 in China, all the way to how we are at and how we're placed today. The paper looks at the impact this crisis has had on shippers all over the world, but it primarily focuses on the impact it's had on small and medium sized businesses, since we know those were impacted the most and the heaviest throughout the last year of 2020. The way we frame this paper is through a historical analysis of what went down and what started, um, you know, circuiting into a series of wrong things from December 2019. So to begin with, I start with what happened in China back then, as we very well know, COVID-19 hit China in December 2019. At that very point of time, manufacturing came to a standstill in a country like China, which is pretty much where everyone sources most of their goods from. At the same time, because of this manufacturing standstill, China had stopped importing quite a few of the raw materials. And at ports, because of labor shortages and ships not entering ports, there was a lot of goods being just stocked up and not being shipped out of the nation. At this very point of time, the first impact that COVID had on the shipping, on the shipping industry was there were a lot of blank sailings introduced. Blank sailings are nothing but ships not planning to set sail according to the schedule that they had initially planned. That being because there were just not enough goods to ship and take to other places of the world since China was not operating at that point of time. This is when the pandemic, but this is when COVID-19 was still an ap epidemic and limited to China. After this, once COVID spread all around the world around March 2020, the labor shortages got acute and even more. There was a shortage of dock workers all around, and especially when we look at a importing nation like the United States, it got really difficult to continue uh, operations as usual. 
I'd like to say at this very point of time, the reason why the supply chain disruption at this very point of time is so needy, how we are, everyone in the world is so needy, is because of the fact that each and every economy around the world has recovered at a very different pace and a very different point of time. It's just been really uneven. And that's because of the uncertainties and the panic that has been there, and we're still reeling from it. Yeah, so to come back to March 2020, when the COVID pandemic spread all around the world and there were labor shortages, what happened at this point of time is empty containers were constantly piling up in the US when they were much more needed in countries like China. China usually imports all their goods on bulk vessels, but when it comes to shipping them back to the US, they need containerized vessels. And that sort of requires a much more need of containers in China, and that's why they need to be repositioned back to this country. But because ships were being quarantined all around the world, and there was just so much mismatch in terms of COVID protocols at each and every border, it got really difficult to keep the shipping processing times in line. This was the first point of time when freight costs all around the world started increasing to never before seen levels. Post this, around, this, around June of 2020, as COVID's reality set in and people realized this is where we're going to be at for a very long time and work from home protocols, study from home protocols were put in place, we all know that demand sparked, spiked by anything in the US because now there was a requirement of desks and chairs and a lot of gym equipment because everyone is now at home. And it's China who makes all of these goods. So again, at this point of time, what happened was China needed these containers where they were constantly being piled up in the US because of labor shortages and containers just not reaching factories in time in the US. China did not get access to enough containers. There was a much more deeper need of containers to be repositioned by this point of time. When we entered the month of October, that's exactly when a lot of other Southeast Asian countries started reopening. In, from India to Indonesia to Vietnam, everyone now needed containers while they were primarily sitting in Europe and the US. This is the point of time when prices really started spiking up and affecting each and every shipper in the trading world. The one interesting impact that this has had on everyone is that Resources have been constantly diverted towards shipping, the shipping industry. For example, when containers were actually being used for rail transport, they had to be diverted to make use of them in the shipping industry to ship goods because there was such a shortage of shipping containers. And at the same time, vessels that used to be usually used to ship bulk goods were also being made use of to ship containerized goods. In the second half of my talk, I'll move on to the impact this entire series of events that has culminated over the last year and a half has had on small and medium sized businesses. The first very interesting impact it has had is it has stressed the margins these traders are already having because they have to pay detention charges and demurrage charges and a lot of premiums at ports and for their freight costs, their margins are really getting squeezed. Also, it's really difficult for them to book a space on ships since larger companies already have booked contracts with large shipping liners for a year or so down the line. So they end up having to purchase their space on ships on spot rates, which press their margins even more. Second, inventory management has become really difficult for these SMB suppliers. They need to plan well, well in advance, but it's really difficult to do so for them when they do not have enough access to where their goods are going to be, where, which part of the shipping line it is going to be. It's just there's not enough transparency for them to understand. They, they're too small and inconsequential for them to have a larger hold on the networks in the supply chain. And because of these high turnaround times, predictability is becoming really difficult for them. Third, a lot of shippers, for example, in India, have sort of stopped trying to ship long distance because it's really risky to ship these long distances. There's lack of resource for real time updates and they just cannot know how long their goods are gonna take on transshipment ports. Lastly, what I'd like to focus on is 
the sort of working capital crunch these SMBs are facing as a result of this. When goods spend such long times in transit, their money gets tied up in transit for much longer. And as a result of this, even their end buyers ask for much longer payment terms, which kind of presses their working capital even more. Shippers can hedge themselves against multiple risks like currency risks and commodity risks, but it has become really difficult for them to hedge themselves against shipping crisis risks. Handling their, their entire uh, business in terms of freight costs and how the impact of container shortage has been on them, it's become really difficult. Some solutions that can emerge at this very point of time is that there needs to be a way to bring much more commonality to COVID protocols at each and every border around the world. I believe that is lacking and that is the cause of confusion and all the uncertainties that we're going through. Second, it's really important to have much more transparency and reliability in all the supply chain networks. By this, the only way we are able to do this is going much more digital in each and every process within each and every supply chain. There has to be multilateral cooperation at this point of time if the world needs to emerge out of the pandemic and build a much more resilient supply chain. I see. Yeah. That's the Thank end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Zavari. Uh, you have uh, set the context of today's discussion uh, in a very clear and precise manner. Uh, uh, basically outlining how we got where we are right now and offering us some ways forward. I think uh, that has set the uh, context for our next speaker, Dr. Nguyen Kwok Chung. Dr. Nguyen, sorry, Dr. Chung, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, because my English is um, very limited, uh, so I would like to use Vietnamese for my presentation. Uh, I'm so sorry for inconvenience for someone. Uh, vâng, theo cái đề nghị của bạn... so, as uh, requested by uh, the organizer, um, to, uh, together with me, Mr. Trần Đức Nghĩa will present uh, about the solution to uh, recover the uh, supply chain. And before going to uh, the presentation, allow me to share a little bit. Uh, and um, Mr. Nghĩa, a co-author, uh, he is also this uh, medium-sized logistic uh, enterprise in Vietnam. And our recommendation, in addition to the research uh, perspective, we also have uh, some practical cases. In my presentation, we want to emphasize on three issues. Firstly, the disruption of the supply chain is the main challenge of the region and the globe. Secondly, the, the forecast on major issue are set out uh, for the region and the globe in the coming time. And thirdly, we uh, propose some solutions to maintain and recover the global supply chain. Uh, to the first point, uh, re evaluate the impacts of the disruption disrupted supply chain to various economies and operators. And um, Mr. Davani Javer already touched upon, then I will emphasize the two other points. Firstly, uh, in the past year uh, or in recent years, uh, we see the trade uh, line originated uh, from China. So China account for 16% of the total trade share and we see a lot of disruption. The main arbors like uh, Shinken or uh, Chungsun uh, in last August, we see a lot of uh, delays or disrupted caused by COVID-19. Every time uh, the seaport uh, closed partially, it's uh, uh, suspended uh, uh, the supply chain and it's all make uh, you know, a lot of uh, difficult um, uh, situation and in Vietnam we are well well aware of the disruption about the uh, sea transportation and also the shipping costs how is influence the economy and following the maritime department of Vietnam uh, since 2020 uh, the shipping costs uh, uh, 
triple the increase to 5,000 US dollar per container. And in 2021, it's around 7,000 to 8,000 uh, US dollar per container. And for a certain transportation route, it's even more. Uh, the impact uh, of uh, the uh, disrupted uh, supply chain to the economy already uh, covered by the last speaker. I will move to the second about the uh, uh, challenges uh, faced by the global and regional supply chain in the coming time. In reality, as in the third quarter of this year, when a zero COVID uh, policy removed the supply chain, uh, uh, has been uh, uh, improved uh, gradually and the uh, uh, supply chain recovery and the sea uh, transport we are facing for uh, uh, following challenges. Firstly, COVID-19 uh, complicatedly happened and different countries uh, come up with different uh, policy. Uh, and uh, for example, China, more than 1000 infected cases and they are maintaining zero COVID policy and they, uh, they lock down and traceability is a policy uh, applied. With that, we are concerning the main uh, seaport still uh, locked down and we still see a lot of disruption uh, challenges. And secondly, uh, the, the demand of the, uh, for the goods and uh, are increasing. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we see uh, the shortage of uh, goods and commodity and it's very very um, especially in by the end of the year with the christmas and the lunar new year and a lot of demands and the global uh trade will increase like eight up to eight percent and sea transportation uh, still face the disruption uh, uh, challenge and the supply chain disruption uh, for uh, following our forecast will be uh, happening in 2022. So in Vietnam and internationally, many, many enterprise book for the new uh, vessels and, and containers. So it requires at least two years for a new uh, ship to be uh, put in place. So we see in the short run, uh, the disruption of supply chains didn't happen certainly about the Taiwanese um, channel uh, uh, the, the threat, uh, and a lot of uh, like military exercise and like uh, very strict uh, announcement um, made by different uh, uh, parties in the SCS and uh, the defense uh, announcement in the April this year they emphasize the military conflict threats uh, from China and they are uh, improving their own military uh, capability or power. And uh, recently in the NASA assembly uh, meeting with the question raised by the delegates, whether China will you know, put an, an attack, a military attack to uh, against uh, Taiwan or not. That is the reason why they, they refer to like a submarine arrangement in uh, uh, Taiping uh, Islands with that uh, security uh, risk. We also think that even with the, you know, even with the control, well controlled COVID-19, we're still uh, facing uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, and the fourth one, to our understanding, with the increased uh, oil price, so therefore the logistic infrastructures and transportation facilities very poor and not as synchronized in Southeast Asia. Vietnam is very open and we upgrade some sea, uh, seaport like Vietnam and Quy Nhiên uh, seaports. And Cambodia, they are uh, building like uh, the, some seaport in the Gulf of Thailand. And uh, this infrastructure, we need to wait until 2025. And then we can see uh, how it can be put in operation. Coping with the uh, above mentioned challenges, we uh, are proposing some uh, solution to sort out the uh, existing challenges. Firstly, different country need to accelerate the process with the COVID-19 pandemic response, which is a shortage of container because of imposing uh, the pandemic uh, preventive measures uh, application to sort it out, regional countries need to 
uh, improve their vaccination coverage and also uh, um, change from zero COVID and to live uh, or adaptive method apply for COVID-19 pandemic. Each country re required for uh, applying the third shot of uh, vaccination for their people. Uh, there are some forecasts uh, about the COVID-19. The uh, like uh, uh, SARS, uh, uh, so a, a coronavirus, they will find a new host like Ebola is like uh, the bat. Uh, and the third uh, feature is like uh, the second uh, influenza and it can remain. Uh, we do not know for sure when the pandemic is over. And uh, in the short run uh, to make the supply uh, smoothly running, we need to uh, fight against uh, COVID-19 effectively. The second recommendation, uh, the government of various country in the region and also WTO and also International Maritime Organization, we need to come up with like a consensus or like a consistent uh, um, solution. ASEAN internal countries and between ASEAN and China, we need to accelerate about the uh, the process of like vaccination coverage to simplify the procedure to like um, to 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 uh, to the uh, the cross border trade uh, with the preventive measure applied like in the border gate of Vietnam share with our uh, adjacent country including China with the, the central government um, um, matters apply so we see a lot of you know like bottlenecks uh, happening in the border uh, last week. Uh, in Chuang, uh, uh, we have a three year uh, plan to have uh, the international uh, route uh, to serve for the trade uh, the activity. They are proposing the seaport uh, uh, in China so in collaboration with uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, seaport to come up with uh, like a common policy on price, on transportation policy for a certain transportation uh, routes. With the, su uh, such a proposal, we need to keep uh, discussing between China and ASEAN country to have a better solution to maintain the global supply chain and uh, to give a smooth running uh, transportation lines and routes for the benefits of the enterprises and the third recommendation the government and the enterprise in the region need to strengthen the collaboration with the digital transformation on taxation and custom procedures so that we can shorten time for custom clearance and then to uh, keep uh, the business uh, running smoothly and we uh, are working out the national digital transformation strategy uh, tax and uh, custom uh, sector, we are accelerating the pro procedures and we shorten the time and the final recommendation for the maritime uh, security. Uh, the country is uh, as relevant. We try to control the disputes we engage like the US, China and other. The sooner the better. Strategic dialogues are uh, improved uh, with uh, via the Taiwan uh, threat and with uh, to, uh, in the SES, uh, uh, to make sure the um, maritime security is uh, smoothly running. Uh, uh, US, uh, China, uh, the virtual summit uh, recently organized, even though it cannot uh, meet uh, like a breakthrough uh, solution, but such dialogues, we can open the opportunity via dialogue ch channel. We can, uh, how to say, control well or mitigate the conflicts or the tension. Those are the recommendation. Uh, from our side at how to maintain the global supply chain in the coming period. So uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, building on the momentum of the first presentation on the challenges we face today, and mo more importantly, offering practical recommendations. Now we are very happy to have Dr. Ashiro uh, to, to join us uh, here today. And uh, may I give him the floor? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, in particular, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers uh, for uh, uh, the invitation to speak at this uh, very uh, excellent event, the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. And I would like also to uh, thank uh, His Excellency, 
the ambassador at NAM for uh, uh, moderating the event. And I'm looking forward for the interaction that we're going to have after the presentation. I put together a couple of uh, uh, notes uh, that I would like to share with the participants in relation specifically to the maritime industry. And uh, um, I have put together uh, those thoughts in a couple of slides. Uh, some of the concepts have already uh, been addressed uh, by uh, Dr. Zaveri and uh, uh, Dr. Kwok Trong from, uh, in the previous presentation, but I'll try to um, summarize some of the aspects specifically in relation to shipping and, and shipping networks, which is core to the work that I am doing. Um, my name is Michele Acciaro. I am based in Hamburg and I work for, uh, until December, for the Cuneo Logistics University as a director of the Apag Lloyd Center for Shipping and Global Logistics, but I will be moving on the 1st of January to uh, Copenhagen at the Copenhagen Business School. So the focus of the presentation is on how maritime transport has contribu contributed to increase resilience in uh, uh, global supply chains. And one of the points that I would like to stress is that uh, has uh, the complexity of managing the pandemic increased over time, especially as we have observed, for example, lockdowns and restrictions on the mobility of citizens and also changes in the behaviors that people had uh, all around the world, uh, we have seen that maritime networks have been extremely resilient. And I think this is a point that is important to stress. We see in the diagram here, which is a summary of the stringency index uh, that is issued by the University of Oxford uh, and summarizes how uh, COVID measures have been uh, around the world limiting economic and social activities. We see that virtually I've selected here five countries, Germany where I'm based, Italy where I'm from, the US as China as important, of course, economies in Vietnam as the location where the conference is based. We can see that uh, since April 2020, we have not come back to normality. There is still a lot of restrictions around the world. And I'm afraid with the surging number of cases that we are observing at the moment again in Europe, that these restrictions are not going to go away. So we're talking about a pandemic that had certainly its spike in 2020. Uh, and I'll say a couple of things about this in a minute, but it's probably something that is there with us and it's going to stay with us in different ways still for a certain period of time. But first point is maritime networks have been very resilient. Um, how has the maritime industry been affected? The first point is important to highlight here is the demand for shipping is what we say uh, as economists is a derived demand. So we uh, do always require to consider that everything that happens in shipping is a result of what is happening on land. Um, and this is something uh, that is very important as there are if there are restrictions on uh, demand, we will always have uh, uh, implications for operations. So we cannot have healthy operations. And what we are observing today in terms of difficulties, for example, uh, in accessibility to capacity and to ships is also the result of the fact that the crisis hit the maritime industry at one of the lower ends of a very long protracted crisis. So in 2020, we had extensive overcapacity, very slow growth in the sector, very low freight rates. And then all of a sudden, we had the necessity as pent up demand required um, uh, capacity and ships, we had to accommodate those changes in the supply chain. We have to say also that in a way, the pandemic has it has in a, in a sort of a lucky fashion. It could have been much worse. There has been um, simulations in, in last year that shown that actually having a gradual spreading of the pandemic has really helped uh, the logistics system to somewhat adapt. And if we had, for example, a, a, a disease that would have spread much more rapidly than COVID had, uh, that could have had even more serious consequence. So we have seen that the maritime sector has been somewhat resilient, at least to the short term uh, shocks. But of course, uh, we have put a lot of stress on supply chains and potentially the pandemic has reduced entirely all the slack, all the flexibility that we had. And I think we all have seen what has happened, for example, with the accident of the Ever Given in the, in the Suez Canal and how that completely uh, contributed to the already uh, very, very tense uh, situation that we had on the, on the supply chain. And there's also still a question on uh, what has been and what could have been the role of governments. And I'm reflecting here on the comment made also by, by Dr. Zaveri in relation, and, and, and also by Dr. Kwok, in relation to um, the necessity to have more coordinated approaches towards uh, the management of the pandemic. 
Important issue also from an operational point of view are, um, of course, what is happening on board of ships. Uh, I think that was already mentioned uh, also in the introductory speech by, by His Excellency Ambassador Ratnam on the uh, on the consequence on the people on board and at ports, uh, and also how uh, the pandemic has been affecting uh, the critical infrastructure, and I think other speakers throughout the conference have highlighted also the longer term uh, in geopolitical as well as economic and, 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 and trading implications of the pandemic. Uh, the responses of the shipping sector has been uh, very um, characterized by, by flexibility. I think it's it's really shocking what has happened, for example, with the layup in the container vessel. You see in the diagram at the bottom of the slide how uh, layup were very high, of course, in, in 2020, and how they have been at a very, very minimum since uh, uh, the second half, I would say October, November of uh, 2020 for the entire year uh, today. And this, of course, is something that is also affecting how uh, capacity has been growing. And I think we definitely have to uh, look at the very high uh, cost uh, that are uh, connected today with, with freight rates that will probably be with us for another, um, for a several months, at least some, some analysts argue until the summer of 2022. Really, we have to search that into the uh, very dramatic reduction in capacity and the uh, lessons that the maritime industry had learned on how to somewhat manage this capacity to ensure that uh, um, they could operate with safe margins. Now, the safe margins, of course, today have become um, the result, has resulted in very high earnings for the industry. From the port sector, I, I would like to, to, to look at the one recent study uh, that looks at, that compares 2019 and 2020, um, spring, summer, spring, summer, autumn, and spring. Um, with uh, uh, the relations of what has happened in ports. And especially, uh, you could see that the majority of trade routes have been very severely effective in terms of capacity. These are the routes which are uh, in blue or, or gray. And you can see that obviously, um, already in, in this comparison between 2019 and 2020, that a storm was being prepared for 2021 because uh, that delayed, of course, with, with uh, um, uh, equipment and these uh, difficulties. When we have disruptions in one side or in one direction, these are likely to take time to be accommodated. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Zavari has already highlighted how equipment has been a major uh, impediment in the uh, quick uh, resolution of some of the supply chain uh, issues uh, or the maritime uh, supply chain issues that we have that have really originated in 2020. We also made ourselves uh, a study looking at uh, blank sailings um, and trying to, to try to understand what was happening in, with blank sailings. And we have seen that definitely blank sailings started in, in intra-Asia trades in February 2020. They moved to the Middle East and India uh, in, in March and then to North America and Europe. And of course, this is this wave, what, what some scholars have called a ripple effect in the disruptions of, uh, of maritime supply chain. It's something that takes time to be accommodated. So of course, that resulted inevitably in a very heavy decrease in reliability, in the reduction on the flexibility on the network, which is, of course, exacerbating any potential uh, additional small disruptions from accidents uh, to uh, maybe shortages of labor or of equipment, and in general, pressure on onshore storage facilities and inventory, and in the result, of course, in an increase in cost, and that we are seeing that very, very clearly. We have seen that very clearly uh, in the spring of 2021. So what are the lessons learned to come to a conclusion to my presentation? Obviously, collaborative approaches and diversification of sourcing are well-established um, uh, approaches to, to increase the resilience of the chain. We have to be thankful that, in a way, there has been a waved um, spread. So there has been this cascading effects that have allowed the supply chain somewhat to, to adapt and to, to respond as the pandemic was unfolding throughout the world. Uh, but we also know that the disruptions have been substantial and uh, uh, they luckily did not result in the collapse of the network, but definitely they having long-term consequences in terms of transportation costs. Uh, it's very important to focus and understand the temporal dynamics of the pandemic, but also to look, to look how uh, the resilience strategy taken over by major manufacturers. And I, I cite here a recent study by, by Ivanov which looks at how companies by repurposing, for example, 
changing uh, the, the, the manufacturing processes within certain factories or by scaling up the manufacturing activities by substituting certain sourcing, um, uh, uh, certain sourcing pathways or intertwining supply chains of different commodities. Uh, for example, the, the healthcare with commercial supply chains have really managed to, to accommodate the closure of factories or the reduction in demand or the change in demand from, from retail, for example, to online demand. And it's very interesting to understand how those strategies have also had implications for, for shipping. I also want to stress that business complexity and supply chain complexity is here to stay. And it's very important that we try to adapt our supply chain systems uh, for a uh, situation where probably these disruptions are going to become more common, whether they are linked to a virus or they are linked to climate change disruptions, or whether they are linked to, um, to, to, to weather events, uh, that's something that will definitely result in higher cost of transportation and supply chain, and we need to be prepared, we need to actually pay those costs to ensure that our supply chains become more resilient and they are also at the responding the needs of global society uh, and so that we are better prepared for the future three final thoughts uh, to to maybe reflect on what will be the role and the implications of mega ships uh, we have we have grown use in the last decade of mega ships Mega ships, though, are very instrumental to maintain low cost of operations. Are they are the best way of actually accommodating demand shock and sudden spike in freight rates? So should we change strategy and have strategy which is more flexible? Bunker fuels, the pandemic luckily hit with bunker fuels that are the lowest, very, very low levels. But we have seen that bunker fuels have increased over time. And we, of course, are also witnessing a lot of tensions on the energy. Uh, um, market. So what will be these implications on the long term of global supply chains? Uh, and also, what is uh, what are the consequences of long term sustainability? And how has uh, the disruptions generated by the virus affected also the transition or been affected by the transition to uh, towards more sustainable shipping? Uh, for example, have been shipping companies holding off on investment because of the uncertainty on what will be the fuel of the future? or what will happen from a regulatory point of view uh, in relation to emission reduction. And I think clarity also in that sense, and a very clear pathway towards de decarbonization for regulators all over the world is very important to ensure that we have a smooth um, investment pathways. And we should always remember that investing in ship is a long, uh, requires time and very often is affecting the way the sector operates for decades to come. So I would like to thank you again for the opportunity to speak, although it's very early here in Germany, it's uh, not even five o'clock in the morning, but definitely I've enjoyed the, the speeches of, uh, of the previous speaker and I'm looking for, and I'm sure I will enjoy also the, the coming speech, speakers and the discussions that we have. So thank you very much for your time and for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Achiro. And thank you for joining us so early in the morning. A very good morning to you. Uh, thank you also for, 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 for underlining not just the stresses and strains the maritime network is undergoing, but, but also its resilience and more importantly, how we need to live in the new normal of complexity as we move forward. Now, let me quickly move on to our next speaker, Dr. Reis. Dr. Reis, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, thank you to the organizer, uh, the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and the supporters of this conference for the kind invitation. And thank you all for your presence online and in person there in Hanoi. Uh, I have not been able to travel out of Hong Kong for nearly two years, which I think is the longest I have been in any single place since I was five years old. So it's very exciting at least to connect online. Um, a disclaimer to start, uh, when I say here are really my own views and do not reflect those of any of the institutions that I am connected to now or have been connected with. This is a very difficult topic to address because while it's very simple, at the end of the day, you're talking about people needing goods, people making goods, and people who make the goods, sending the goods to people who need them, and the transport of them and delivery. It, 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 it's pretty simple. But there are so many factors involved, um, the proverbial and literal many moving parts, that 
it cannot really be dealt with adequately in some ways by specialists or single sector experts, or even by, with all due respect, with uh, logistics experts and shipping experts. I, I say this because the current supply chain problems, mainly those related to shipping, which accounts for 80% of global trade by volume and about 70% by value. Um, now, what, this was highlighted to me in discussions I, in discussions I had um, with friends at the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council, PECC, which is based in Singapore. And indeed, I commend to you uh, PEC's latest State of the Region report, which deals well with the topic that we're talking about this session. So, so fairly early this year, certainly before the summer, I heard about these shipping disruptions and bottlenecks, mainly related to onboard infections of, by COVID-19, quarantine rules, crew change restrictions, vaccination issues related to ship crews, the need for vaccinating. Um, now, this is not my specialty, but I, I sought to find supply chain experts who might weigh in on this and write a piece for my institute, for the Asia Global Institute, on this problem. I, I really couldn't find anyone to do, who was willing to do this. Now, mind you, um, this was before there were any news stories about the issue. So I was indeed somewhat shocked to find not, no real coverage of this challenge which people were talking about, but yet uh, was not really in the news. Uh, in retrospect, I, I should have written the paper myself, but um, I, I wasn't following it all so closely. But uh, let me make three points in this regard. Um, and uh, I, I think you all know these points, but it's probably well worth remembering them in the context of this discussion. So we're not just talking about movement of a product from A to B, uh, from manufacturer to, from, from the producer to, to the uh, retailer, then to the, onto the consumer. Uh, we're actually talking about even the raw materials that go into uh, a product. So in order for a manufacturer to make a product, they must source uh, the raw materials for it. So if you take a mobile phone and it's, and, and, you know, it's not just about electronics or machinery like an automobile with components as we think of them, uh, particularly now, you know, you have sm smart devices and they require smart enabling components like semiconductors. But, but this also applies to items such as a garment, uh, a suit, even a t just a t-shirt. Um, the entire item is typically not made in just one location but in many different places. And an item may actually cross borders before it even gets sent off to the retailers or to the distributors. So you could have a suit, uh, for example, that, that crosses borders and is made of products from all over the world, India, China, Korea, the buttons from somewhere, the zipper from somewhere, the textile from another place, maybe finally assembled in Romania and then sent finally to a clothes rack uh, in downtown Toronto, right, where it ends up. The second point I would make is supply chains that have developed over time have become super efficient. And I say this because many years ago when the iPod, now you have to think back, we're talking about iPod era, uh, not even iPhone, iPod. I thought about, well, I should get one, right? And I was feeling sorry for myself in New York. I was in New York one summer. And I thought, well, I'll go online to the Apple store and I'll buy an iPod and make it difficult for Apple to fulfill this order by including a requirement for engraving my uh, initials and my email address on this iPad. So I, I ordered it on a Sunday evening in New York. I, you, you can't imagine my shock when I received the very iPod I had ordered. Uh, perfectly fulfilled with the exact engraving Thursday morning in New York. So just think about that. Now, I, how did it happen so quickly? Now, I, I was very curious. So I went online, checked the, um, uh, uh, the, the delivery uh, direction, we know the, 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 the way bill. And again, to my shop, this item didn't come from a fact, uh, 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 an inventory or warehouse in California to me in, the, in New York. No, no, it started out 
right there in Hangzhou in China and went pretty much directly to me through Anchorage, Kentucky, New Jersey, and then by delivery um, to Manhattan in New York. So the perfect fulfillment in that short period, less than five days, uh, perfect fulfillment of order and many years ago. So you can imagine the efficiency of um, the uh, supply chains uh, today. Now, a third point I would make is that not every item is valued equal by the consumer, equally by the consumer. And I don't mean price. I'm talking about need in some respect. So I talk about, for example, um, um, if you if you go back a, a, about a year ago or so, more than a year ago, year and a half ago, I was in the United States uh, just before the Lunar New Year celebrations, the Tet celebrations um, that were take place here in Hong Kong. And already we were aware of the coronavirus and there was shortages of masks in, here in Hong Kong. So while I was in the US, I tried to source masks. I couldn't find any. Um, I found some in, in, in New York City. I, I found about 60 through Amazon. And then luckily when I was in Denver before returning to Hong Kong, I found about 160 more and I brought 220 masks back to Hong Kong because we were in shortage. And uh, I had so many requests from friends to bring back masks. Eventually I had to send some of those masks back to the United States because I had friends, colleagues and family in the US who couldn't find masks uh, uh, in the United States as their pandemic took a, took a hold. So I guess my point is that um, the motivation for supply chains uh, and how they're laid out. And I, as I say, I'm going, you have to think about them as really a chain, not just of this transport system or the logistic system, but the sourcing by manufacturers of all their raw materials, et cetera. So there's price and there's efficiency and the lowering of tariffs over the years of regionalization and multilateral trade liberalization and the lowering of transport costs have meant that you have a complex supply chain and you know more likely it's with China in the loop somewhere because you know we say global supply chain but it's really a sort of China dominated supply chain isn't it um, so there's price and there's efficiency, but some goods are more necessary than others. And this depends, this depends on the, of course, on the context. So during the coronavirus, we need the PPEs, we need the masks, but we also may need certain simple sundries that we don't think much about, like toilet paper. Who are the world's powers in toilet paper? I mean, that's an interesting question. And now we're talking about strategically important items such as semiconductors and rare earths and mineral. And we talk about the need for energy security, food security. So all of those issues um, are questions that we have to think about when it comes to, well, what is the need? What do we have to do? What is this thing called supply chain resilience? And, 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 and you cannot, you can no longer just rely on the logistical issues. Right? I would say, uh, first of all, immediate in terms of the challenge we face today with the supply chain bottlenecks, the immediate priority must be the public health issue, especially as it pertains to ship crews, air crews, crew changes, vaccinations of crews, what are the quarantine restrictions, what are the crew change requirements, all of these are causing uh, uh, problems, right? Now, that should be the priority. Unfortunately, in my mind, it, the, um, it seems that the solution has to be a multi-sector solution with all the different players in the supply chain working together. Not sure uh, this is going to be possible, especially if you think about how the costs of a container have grown up. So the average cost of moving goods across the world has increased by about 500% uh, during the pandemic. What is the motivation for some of these shippers to actually uh, resolve the issue if you're making money hand through fist right now? I don't know, right? But I do know that people I, I know who have asked uh, some of these port operators, uh, shipping companies, well, 
why don't you take care of some of the issues like vaccination? Well, uh, one of the plain, more plain spoken ones have said things like, well, we're making money, right? And, and there you go. One is the motivation, right? Uh, to, to actually uh, come together and resolve some of these issues. Uh, lastly, because I know my time and, and I think the timer for keeping time is, I, I just want to, to raise a number of issues and I'm sorry that it's kind of uh, very uh, haphazard here. Um, there is the geopolitics, right, of it all. Uh, so you have both the geoeconomics and the geopolitics. Now, striving for, su for supply chain resilience is nothing new. Um, we've had these plus one strategies, commercial uh, decision makers who said, we don't want to depend too much on China. So we've had plus one. Vietnam is a major recipient, a major beneficiary of the plus one strategies They've in play for years. Bangladesh also uh, made uh, the best, greatest beneficiaries. But now plus one has become a kind of over, uh, has gone on overdrive for because of the geopolitical tensions, the US-China trade war, but not just, it's not just about US-China, but also about uh, tensions between other, among other countries, for example, China and Australia, China and Canada, China and India. Now I, I, I know I, I keep saying China, so, um, uh, we, we, you know, so, so there is something to that. Now, what, what, what are some of the solutions? Well, we hear about decoupling, right? I don't think decoupling is at all feasible. You can't suddenly say you have any sort of absolute decoupling, but you can do what perhaps the United States has more in mind. I mean, you've heard Catherine Tai, the US trade representative talk about recoupling recoupling now she defined it very specifically in her talk at the uh, in washington she said you know how can we have a relation a trade relationship with china where we are occupying a strong and robust robust position within the supply chain and there is a trade that's happening as opposed to a dependency that that was her those were her words and saying well this is what she means by recoupling and indeed, I think every country will now have to decide, well, how do we manage to ensure safe and secure, efficient and cost effective supply of goods that we really need? And indeed, um, it rebounds also not just on goods, but also the infrastructure. How do you ensure that um, your suppliers, your, your own ports, your own infrastructure are to standard. And that's one of the biggest problems in the United States right now is a lot of the infrastructure is kind of outdated. Um, lastly, because I know I've run out of time, um, I just want to uh, bring up two more things. One is um, this idea uh, it, it is climate change. And I think we have to think if as the supply chain shift and we remodel them and you try to make them more resilient, we have to think about what it means for energy consumption, for people's consumption. I mean, one of the issues that's creating the bottlenecks today is this overconsumption in certain markets. And it's, this is unsustainable. And we have to think that as we reconfigure, whether it's offshoring, reshoring, onshoring, um, that we have to think about, well, what are the implications of rejigging all of these um, uh, supply chains, what, is the, what are the implications for climate change? Secondly, I would say um, nationalism, the idea that we're, if you look at the United States, for example, the whole idea of the buy America first, what are the implications of that? Can you really have a buy America first or a buy uh, native first uh, strategy and yet have the efficiency, the security of supply. Um, I think you need to think about, think regionally, you have to think globally as well, but you also have to think strategically. And um, I would note here, uh, just because it's very topical, the Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, uh, just the other day, uh, spoke about how the United States is looking at potentially, well, in, in the context of saying she, the United States wouldn't join CPTPP immediately, um, she talked about creating 
um, supply chain based on trusted relationships among democracies. Uh, I wonder about the wisdom of, of, of that kind of strategy uh, to say, well, we only want to deal with democ democracies to, to, to create a, some kind of supply chain of trust, a tr you know, a circle of trust. I'm not sure this works. I think it's a bit of folly. Um, yes. So we, we have to think about some of those risks, uh, the, um, geopolitical risks coming up. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you have left us with a lot of food for thought in terms of what supply chain resilience is really about. Uh, may I quickly go to our last uh, uh, speaker, our discussant, uh, Ms. Shioko Goto, who has the really daunting task of trying to distill all these key points and frame it for us. Uh, uh, Ms. Chiyoko uh, Goto, it, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Rajnam. Um, no pressure, I don't think, right? Uh, thank you to, to the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam for hosting this discussion. It's a great opportunity to uh, talk about um, something that's been very much in the headlines worldwide. There has been a great deal of talk about the need for supply chain resiliency over the last two years when we see manufacturing bottlenecks and shipping delays be, um, that have really exposed the vulnerabilities in the broader logistics industry. Um, and we, have, we are now very well aware that the infrastructure worldwide is not necessarily risk resilient. Um, what we also find is that um, when we look at the history of shipping, um, Game-changing moments actually occur when one, when there are unexpected disruptions such as war or some crisis, and another from changes in technology, including the creation, in the case of um, supply chains and shipping in particular, the creation and development of containers. So COVID has been this double whammy of one, we're seeing this disruption from an unexpected shutdown of the global economy with borders and port closures that coincided also with a surge in demand for goods later on. And we've also seen this unprecedented strain on supply chains as a result, which have challenged the existing infrastructure capabilities and prevailing systems. And this comes at a time when tensions between the United States and China remain high and China itself is shifting its economic base. And there are new opportunities uh, for the manufacturing industry in Southeast Asia emerging as a result. And I found our four speakers really touching upon many of the questions that are arising. And I, I was also very struck by some of the solutions that they have proposed too. Um, turning first to Devani um, pointing out about the rising freight costs, um, the gap between the logistics providers and the actual manufacturing sector um, is of course striking. And I was particularly struck about how she pointed out that there is a high price to be paid less by the big companies, but by the small and medium sized enterprises. The big companies can of course absorb a lot of the costs. And we hear about uh, companies like Costco, for instance, re renting container space, but small and medium-sized enterprises cannot afford to pass on this cost to consumers. Um, so um, when she said that um, India, as part of that solution, uh, some companies, some Indian operators are actually avoiding long distances, that was particularly striking because it also reflects some of the strategies that the Indian government has taken when it comes to trade relations. For instance, um, India actually is not part of um, either the CPTPP or RCEP, um, the two big regional uh, trade frameworks. Um, and there is this uh, focus much more on building domestic resiliency, not just because of the result of COVID, but also because um, of its commitment to um, domestic resilience that has only been spurred on further by um, the outbreak of, of this pandemic. Um, which, when she pointed out um, about the need um, or rallying cry for a standardization of COVID protocol, I think that has been resonated, um, echoed by a number of speakers, uh, including uh, Mr. Nguyen Kok Tron. Um, and he really focused on the issue of the disruptions and delays caused by COVID 
and the astronomical rise in shipping costs. Um, and he too pointed out that different countries having different policies regarding COVID protocol and having different um, approaches to lockdown and contract tracing have really been um, something that has hard hit the shipping industry. Uh, seaport lockdowns in particular have been, have been incredibly um, stressful on them. Um, but I was also struck too by how he pointed out um, that there have also been other developments over the last two years since the outbreak of the pandemic, um, not, uh, not disregarding the um, rise of security concerns. He talked a little bit about Taiwan and uh, the growing tensions in cross-strait relations. And of course, that has great geopolitical uh, consequences but it also is something that does impact the shipping industry as well. He also pointed to the increased oil prices, which is hurting profit margins of um, the shipping industry as well. Um, and I, I think and the suggestion that um, uh, when, when we are looking at the development of new seaports, uh, there, this could actually provide an opportunity for China and ASEAN member countries to work more closely together to come up with a better solution to maintain a efficient um, and cost effective supply chain is something that I do think I would want to hear a little bit more about um, in this discussion. Um, turning to Michele, uh, he pointed out that supply chains have been strained but they're actually not broken. Uh, they are actually incredibly resilient and they have been able to um, adjust to extreme swings. That really um, struck me um, as something like Friedrich Nietzsche would say, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I do think the, um, it, it has made the industry uh, stronger. Um, and we've also seen the shipping industry becoming much more flexible in responding to the variance in, in demand, as well as swings in cost. Uh, but at the same time, uh, he did point out the need for a more collaborative approach, um, as well as a diversification of sourcing, and that uh, the complexities of businesses is not going to go away, even if the pandemic were to um, settle down, uh, because there are always going to be other risks and not least uh, future health crises as well. And so supply chains do need to uh, expect disruptions. Uh, one of the issues that he briefly touched upon about the climate challenge is something that I would actually want uh, for him to expand a, a bit more on. Um, and also um, the issue of the future of mega ships. Um, of course, mega ships were developed to lower costs but when we see um, this idea of resilience, um, this whole idea about self-reliance coming up and economic nationalism uh, rising across the globe, um, it, how is that going to um, change this idea of megaships? Um, we talk about supply chains going from just in time to just in case. What does that mean for the shipping industry? What does it mean? Uh, for shipping and uh, for shippers to actually be cost uh, competitive, yes, but also resilience, resilient to shocks. Um, and then finally, this issue about sustainable shipping um, and the decarbonization challenge. I think um, certainly the energy transition is something that affects all countries and all industries. Um, and certainly the shipping industry, and certainly when we go up the that, go look at the value chain, we are going to have to really address this idea of energy transition, um, which of course is an issue that was brought out um, by Alejandro, who covered a whole range of issues. But I really did appreciate the fact that he brought it down to basic first principles. That is to say that shipping um, and supply chains is really, at, at the end of the day, it is a basic equation, uh, move, producing and transporting from A to B. Uh, but at the same time, this, that simplicity 
um, underestimates the need, the complexity, the tremendous complexity of the supply chain um, and the shipping industry that is key, plays such a key part on it. Um, and we do need a much more holistic collaborative effort in, uh, in trying to come up with a new uh, paradigm. I think what we have done uh, so far is that we've reached a common understanding that supply chain resilience needs to be increased at all levels uh, from basic consumer goods to critical supplies. Um, there has been inflationary pressure uh, because of the vulnerabilities in the supply chain. And it's also raised awareness of the need to hedge risks. And it's also jump-started discussions about what exactly are critical supplies. I'm hoping that in this discussion, we can talk a little bit more about um, Vietnam's critical role in the supply chain and heightened expectations for Vietnam to leverage its position as a manufacturing hub that is a member country of not one, but two of the world's biggest trade agreements. And um, as I noted before, we know that there are going to be crises um, looming on the horizon, not just um, on the healthcare front, but there are environmental risks. We're seeing sea levels rise. Uh, there are changes in geographic realities. We're seeing the threat of Pacific Island submerging port cities being impacted. Um, with some running the risk of actually being flooded in varying degrees. We see that air quality at ports is worsening now that many of them are open 24 seven at higher capacity than ever before, which is also damaging not just to the workers themselves, but to local communities. And so focusing our attention on supply chain is also an opportunity, I believe, to identify critical industries prioritize infrastructure um, investment um, opportunities as well. It's also time to address some of the longer term issues, including environmental sustainability and, and the challenges of climate change and workers' rights. Um, and as Alejandro said, it, it may also be a time for us to reassess our own patterns of consumption as well. And this becomes a much bigger agenda of trying to, to come up with a broader framework of defining economic competitiveness and economic integration and cooperation amongst nations. And it should be an opportunity uh, for us to reassess um, how we can collaborate um, in uh, investing in infrastructure and think of ports and shipping as common goods for the world. So thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that. Sorry to interrupt, but I think we have a whole series of questions. Uh, so many people are interested in. I will reverse the order of priority for questions and give actually the first questions to the young people's uh, young young leaders program who have asked a very basic question, and I'll open it up to all our uh, the, uh, all our speakers today. It's a very fundamental question for all of us who live in this region. How can ASEAN benefit from the situation? And is there any challenges that ASEAN can take? And as a subset to that question, what does air traffic, air cargo, how does that change the equation? And what, what role can ASEAN play in that? Can I open that question? Uh, this comes from our young leaders panel. A few of them have raised this question. Can I open that up to the uh, our, our speakers today? Would anybody like to take that on? After race, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, uh, I know this question was not addressed to me, but I, 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 I think it's important. You know, ASEAN. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about centrality and uh, what Sun has talked about, um, RCEP and the CPTPP, these new trade uh, arrangements. Uh, I think, in many ways. ASEAN is doing what it should be, because if you think about ASEAN as kind of the core, certainly, of um, the RCEP, and you have four countries of ASEAN, four ASEAN members as members of the CPTPP, um, and Vietnam being uh, uh, both uh, you know, one of those four that's both in CPTPP and RCEP, um, it, it, what it does is it offers more choice. 
you know, so that you can really diversify. If companies who are approaching um, the region and want to uh, invest or manufacturers want to um, leverage the price uh, advantages or efficiency advantages, then you have much more choice because of these arrangements. Um, the question is, uh, are companies willing to go right in and look at you know the the very extensive um, lists and uh, you know I mean it, CPTPP is a very complex document I mean five thousand pages I think uh, and and um, and then what what happens if you get China into it Taiwan into it again uh, there is something there and then the the um, uh, after, I mean, we already have this kind of ASEAN free trade uh, area, African, uh, ASEAN free trade agreement. But um, is it, how authentic is it? And this is where I think this ASEAN economic community is still in my mind a work in progress, because if you're going to fully um, diversify or offer opportunities for diversification, um, away from a China sort of dependent uh, supply chain, then you need to make the ASEAN economic community much more authentic in terms of how common a common market is it, right? In mm -hmm. terms of everything standards and all that sort of thing. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, does any of our other speakers have anything to add on? Or I'll open the floor up to, uh, to, to my friends in this room. Uh, do they have any questions? Sorry, who's it, uh, Dr. Ashiro? Uh, Dr. Ashiro, please go, go ahead. Yes, a, a brief. thank you very much. I was just mentioned as one of the, of the people to address the question together with Dr. Zaveri. So I just wanted to mention very quickly that it's very difficult to replace maritime transport. And I think it's been highlighted by multiple speakers and also uh, Dr. Yai is that uh, essentially we are dependent on integrated global supply chains, which are maritime supply chains as, as it was mentioned already so i think there might be alternatives sometimes we talk about land bridges we talk about uh, railway transport for example from asia to europe sure these are all good additions but maritime transport will remain a com fundamental component of global supply chain thank you uh, um mr Murray, please you have the floor yeah just to add on to what uh, was already said I think when we're addressing the question about how ASEAN can uh, leverage this current situation, there's been a lot of conversation going about having China plus one sourcing strategies, which benefits a lot of Southeast Asian countries. But what needs to be noted at this point is while the West can start relying much more <clears throat> on plus one countries, the plus one countries have to first kind of reduce their own reliance on China for a lot of raw materials that they themselves import from China to then produce goods to sell to the US and EU. So that's one thing that needs to be highlighted over here. And this will constantly be a challenge because to compete with China's cost competitiveness is a very long journey for any country. And that's the challenge that I'd like to address at this question. Uh, I think you also asked another question on air freight and in the short term because of demand spikes in the EU and US there has been a lot of adoption of air freights that has been seen. I think people are okay with paying those high costs just to get their goods back in place but I, within a year or so once things sort of settle down I do not see air freight becoming one of the largest drivers of shipping. As it's already highlighted, we cannot replace maritime shipping anytime soon. Thank you very much for that. Can I open up the floor now uh, to the ladies and gentlemen in this room? Is there anybody who wishes to ask a question? I have just a question, uh, uh, some uh, comment to uh, my uh, to uh, room number two. Uh, doctor, sorry, uh, my, uh, uh, Michael. Oh, sorry, Doctor Jung. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yes, I can, uh, can, uh, can start uh, okay. the, 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 yeah, the, the question to uh, Mike and uh, Ase Cairo, okay? <laughs> I think it is a very interesting and uh, very modernized way of uh, presentation. I learned a lot of information from uh, uh, Mia, Mia Michele, okay? 
But uh, my interest here is that you can uh, provide some uh, some uh, solution to uh, overcome the disruptive the, the supply chain. I think it's very important. One of the solution I would like to I would like you can make clear about the diversify of uh, sources of uh, suppliers. But I think when you diversify it to overcome the disruptive the supply chain, you can face with the, the increased cost of uh, switching costs. They are switching costs. I think very important. And the second one, I think, uh, when you try to diversify it, whether or not we can uh, take it into consideration the increase about the, the increase of the, the, the inventory, maybe the increase the inventory or stock. Maybe uh, this is, I think, the ways, the normal ways that some uh, enterprise can, uh, can use yeah. uh, to respond to the disruptive uh, supply chain. Thank and you. the third one, I think you can organize a smart factory. Maybe smart factory, you can, can move a capital from this country to other country in a short time and establish the premise. And I think Germany has a lot of uh, advantages in uh, maybe set up uh, where a smart, uh, smart factory to respond to this situation. But uh, I would like you can uh, can 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 provide some uh, experiences on this, and maybe some your uh, new idea or new initiatives. Then. Okay, overcome thank you for that. on your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I will take uh, one other question from the young leaders uh, who, who 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 have raised their hands, and then I will give our, uh, our panel a chance to summarize and and give their views on this. Uh, who would like to take the floor from the young leaders? I understand there were two. Sorry, please go ahead. If not, uh, since we are running out of time, I will. Oh, okay. okay. Please go ahead. Hello. Please be brief. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me well? Yes, uh, please, uh, it's not so, I think your audio is not, mic is not on. If not, uh, but, no, we can't hear you. Hello. I don't even hear you. Oh dear. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I will, because we are running out of time. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to take the floor from the young leaders? If not. Vâng, có khi trong lúc mà chờ chương trình lãnh đạo trẻ có thêm câu hỏi ấy, thì tôi cũng xin muốn chia sẻ một vài ý kiến liên quan đến câu hỏi đầu tiên. While waiting for the young leader, I would like to share a little bit the first one how ASEAN can benefit from the disruptive supply chain, which challenge should be sorted out. Challenges we have talked, have been talking since this morning. Uh, because of the COVID-19 and disruptive uh, supply chain, we, we can see some opportun opportunities. And from Vietnamese perspective, we can find it out. The first opportunity to promote uh, the digital transformation. And in the last presentation, I did tell you the tax and custom uh, uh, agency, uh, they are accelerating the digital transformation during the pandemic and we meet uh, we try to meet the target of the country 20 uh, digital economy will uh, make uh, uh, 25 percent uh, and uh, 2030 uh, will be 30 percent vietnam and other regional countries they also set out such uh, targets and we uh, they are all achievable uh, second object uh, second opportunity uh, after uh, we see clearly the pandemic and the disruptive uh, supply chain 
and the regional country uh, have been uh, revising their policy with such a revision e we even minor change but it, uh, it can save a lot of uh, uh, costs uh, for all and funding uh, for the uh, enterprises like um, like um, the quarantine procedures uh, saving or uh, one door uh, one window policy can save the time and resources uh, thirdly the uh, that disruptive supply chain can uh, encourage the enterprise on ship uh, building and container making uh, so in vietnam last april hua fat uh, corporation is quite big uh, ones with the steel uh, production they initiate uh, a container making a project to supply for the market the these are three opportunity we can uh, figure out uh, during the uh, COVID-19 and also the disruptive supply chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question from this room uh, from the uh, uh, from a lady. Uh, may I give her a floor to raise a question? Please. Can raise your question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hương. Uh, I'm from the Ministry of Industry and Trade of Vietnam. And uh, first, thank you very much for uh, the permit to allow me to have a question today. Uh, as you all know that um, the sea lands and transportation uh, play very important roles uh, in international uh, international trade, especially during the pandemic. And so from the theories and uh, from the practice, uh, what do you think of recommendations and proposal uh, for our governments and the policy makers uh, to support or to help the business uh, and the logistic uh, system uh, better to overcome this uh, trouble times and all the difficulties like uh, from the, the presentations that a lot of difficulties and challenges like uh, uh, no vessel, no uh, container and the price going very high. Uh, I think this question is all open for our speakers and participants in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you all for the questions. May I now return back to the panel if you have any, if you want to address some of these questions and also uh, if you have any final comments, I will let the ladies have the floor first, uh, starting uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Shihoko uh, Goto, whether she wants to address any of these points or any final comments. To make thank you yeah um this is only tangentially touching upon the question but i i do think this is an opportunity uh for the vietnamese economy to um uh, take a leading role in this amongst the asean member countries as i pointed out earlier um vietnam is of course a member of both rcep and CPTPP, and with that, there are higher expectations for Vietnam from the rest of the world. Um, and we had already seen a trend of supply chains um, moving away from China to Southeast Asia, and one of the most popular destinations, especially for like Japanese companies, um, has been uh, Vietnam. Now, the challenge, of course, is the fractured nature um, and so um, governance that would actually harmonize some of the rules, um, which would be part and parcel uh, of being a TPP and RCEP member country, uh, would certainly only further the attractiveness and competitiveness of um, uh, Vietnam in the supply chain hierarchy. Thanks. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Vary, you have the floor. To be honest, um, I would actually like to ask a, the same question Ms. Shihoku asked to Ms. Do Dr. Michael, and I want him to just touch upon a little more on how sustainability is the way to go in the coming decade in this industry, keeping in mind how COVID has impacted us in the last year and how we can move forward. Since I know these are his interests and this is what his niche is, I'd really like to have some more words from him on that. Thank you very much. Uh, now, now can I turn to uh, Dr. Chung in the other conference room? Dr. Chung, do you have any final words or comments? Uh, so I agree uh, with um, uh, Ms. Uh, Sihoko. In addition to the opportunity as identified some minutes ago, we talk about policy revision, uh, um, uh, uh, digital transformation, and uh, a major opportunity for uh, regional countries. Uh, they can receive uh, the new investment sources. Personally, I do think that uh, um, investment uh, shifting is the, not because 100% uh, of uh, COVID-19 or disruptive supply chain. The, the movement of investment from China to ASEAN countries in general and Vietnam in particular, it is like industry uh, shifting is already uh, happened uh, when the, we see that uh, the uh, trade uh, crisis, trade war, and uh, COVID-19 just, how to say, to speed it up a little bit. That is the point. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Michelle Ashiro, do you have anything else to add? Thank you. Thank you very much. There has been a lot of uh, excellent questions that have been raised, um, and some of the questions have already been addressed in relation to, to resilience. So I will come to a point that was already uh, raised by uh, Ms. Cotto, as well also by some of the speakers, and also by, uh, by Dr. Zaveri in relation to sustainability. And that's also a topic that is very, very important for me. And I think there are two aspects here. Uh, the first one is, of course, how can uh, ASEAN economies in general can adapt and can develop a sustainable uh, development strategy. And I think a lot of, of, of action has been taken in this direction. Also, for example, with the first state of climate change report that was published in October, which is focusing on Asia, ASEAN countries specifically. I think it's very important also for fast growing economies to have uh, climate change at the center of the development strategy. So that is from the side of of, of uh, the opportunity that was mentioned already also by, by Ms. Goto. Uh, or climate change adaptation or sustainability is an opportunity. The second point is related to sustainable shipping. This is a global industry. So a lot of the challenges are to take place at a global level, uh, but there is no reason to expect the shipping cannot become more sustainable industry, but we have to be ready to pay the price uh, for this. And I think this comes of course to manufacturers and consumers uh, if you really want to shipping to become greener, then I'm afraid that the cost of shipping ought to go a little bit higher. But that is good for uh, for shipping and is good for society and for the world. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Reis. You have uh, any few words before we end? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't have really much more to add aside from uh, you know, if we think again, I, you know, I, I bring back this issue to 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 its simplest level is. People need things, people produce things. We want to get the, the stuff that people produce to the, stuff, uh, to the people that need them uh, in an efficient, reasonable, cost-efficient manner. And um, so, but we have to think of it, not just about the, the, the transport of these things. We have to think of it as, well, what's going into the manufacturing? What's going into, um, delivery from the first mile to the port. What is the quality of the port? What is the quality of the shipping? What, what, what are the options in terms of other means of transport? What is the, um, the quality of the infrastructure? What are the conditions for um, truck, truckers? What is the conditions for longshoremen, working conditions of, of, of all these people? In, in many ways, uh, you know, we, we can talk very abstractly about the supply chain issues, supply chain resilience, but we're talking about people's employment. We're talking about people needing things from hair dye to baby supplies. 
to and not just about you know the big things like um, uh, mobile phones or electronics and that sort. So so again, you know, I would suggest that when policymakers um, sit down and try to uh, uh, um, address the problems, particularly the very immediate problems of public health, that it, it, what, it, what, what is required is to think about, well, how can we get all the different players together and have a conversation about all of these issues and come up with solutions that are in fact sustainable, thinking about climate change, thinking about um, uh, longer term issues and trying to put the geopolitics a bit to the side. Now, I know that's very difficult these days, but um, I think a country like Vietnam has actually, in my mind, shown the way on how to do this, because uh, particularly distinguish itself as both part of um, uh, CPTPP and RCEP, that uh, Vietnam has, I think, done well, not just to be part of that diversification, but also to, 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 to lead the way in some ways about trying to just see, well, what can we do better, more efficiently to do that simple thing of getting goods from the people that make them to the people that need them? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, that is an excellent way to end this uh, really excellent session that we have had uh, today. I think my, uh, my, my own takeaway is that listening to all of you all, listening to the participants um, here, is that we need to ask the right questions if you want to find the right answers. So I think today's uh, session is all about questions, not answers. And uh, this is a, a space that we need to watch as we move forward. So it just leaves me to thank our excellent speakers for pointing us in the right direction. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us here today. And thank you to all the participants for enriching this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ratnam. And with that, our morning sessions has come to an end. The lunch is now served uh, on the first floor, uh, the place for yesterday lunch. And don't forget to tune in for the live commentary at 1.20. If you wish to attend it live, you can go back to conference room one, or you can watch it via Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for watching our online participants. Please follow us on Twitter, the South China Sea Connect on Twitter, on Instagram, and also TikTok. Yes, we're also on that app. And please click follow.